Welcome everyone to a very Friday, very live edition of From the Ground Up podcast. I don't know what makes it very live. I think it's very live every day, but uh, Friday, it's kind of a weird day, but I, I am drinking a fine IPA out of my Brony Ales glass right here. So uh, yeah, I'm super pumped to get this podcast underway because we're going to be talking about corn snakes, which is you know one of my favorite species of snakes and is really personal to me as well as the guest that is coming on. But let me not get too far into that. But our sponsor, we have a new sponsor on board. It is Focus Cube. So please go check out Focus Cube for all their enclosures. They have sent me quite a few enclosures and uh, I've posted them on social media. I have things in which uh, the customers they do is incredible. Um, I have a cutout of my logo on top of an enclosure that lights up. I have um, glass in the back of a enclosure um, that has my logo in it. All this amazing stuff and all these amazing products in which that they have. They even have things like Gecko Legends and stuff like that. So please go check out Focus Cube. They're doing amazing things over there. They also had a podcast on the Herpetopulture. Herpetopulture. It's because I had a beer before this. Herpetoculture podcast. I'm always so bad at the herpetoculture word or herpetofauna and all that stuff. All those words, too many syllables. We need to cut them down. So Herp Mag or Herp Podcast. Wow, I just fucked everything up. Um, yeah. So check them out on that podcast. Other than that, PortCityPythons.com, PortCityPet.com. I have some corn snakes available as well as our guest today. Laura from Windsor, but so go check out her corn snakes as well. Anyway, we'll we'll just get to it. It's going to be a little bit of a corn snake 101, everything that you want to know to get into corn snakes as well as some other stuff. So if you're someone who has bred and kept corn snakes for quite a while, I hope you can still get some information out of this because, uh, yeah, we're just going to have a good conversation with Laura from Wind Serpents, and she's been on the podcast before, so please go check out the last one we did with her. But Laura, welcome back to the podcast. Hello. Good to be so, back. Seems like course. it wasn't that long ago. So. Um, it really wasn't, but then again, it was like, it was stage one of quarantine. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Which now, like, and I now think I'll... we stopped counting stages. Yeah, yeah the days just run together. <laughs> It's like, I felt like it was, you know, maybe in a reasonable, like maybe in the spring or so when, when I had you on the podcast, but mm -hmm. it felt like it was going to end eventually. Yeah. Doesn't look so good. Mm -mm. Yeah. I've got <laughs> friends who are like, Oh, what are you doing for Halloween? And I'm like, nothing. Watching scary movies at home by myself with my cat. <laughs> so do we like throw the candy at people or how do we go? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. We don't ever get trick-or-treaters anyways because this is like a weird gated community thing and there's just not any kids. So I don't know. I We tried like the first year I moved in. I was like, yeah, we're going to get candy and give it out and nobody came. So we had this giant bowl that we had to finish ourselves. And this was before I made a lot of like local friends. So we didn't have anybody to share it with. It was just the two of us. So yeah. I'm sure you got along just fine. Oh yeah. We got yeah. all stuff we liked, so at least it was that. Yeah, I mean, we all kind of buy too much, and so that we can get oh, the yeah. rest of it. Or if you have kids, I guess you steal theirs. Yeah, we don't have those. <laughs> no, we only reproduce <laughs> corn snakes. So let's talk a little bit about corn snakes. Um, so, <laughs> okay, what what first got you into corn snakes in particular? Um. Well, it was a. It was kind of a. I want to say it was a long journey, but it was actually just a matter of like a few months from me going, I kind of want a snake to, I really want a corn snake to, I really want to breed corn snakes. Um, it, it started with, you know, I saw a, a snake at the zoo. Uh, I was a little, um, I don't remember if it was a smooth or a rough green snake. It was one of the two. They're both native to Ohio. So I don't know, but it was at a, a local zoo. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's the cutest thing ever. And I had been wanting a pet because we have, we have Oscar. He's probably wandering around somewhere. There's cat toys on the floor. Um, but uh, he would always sit with Kyle because, you know, they were bonded and I was the new person that just you know, moved in. And so I wanted a pet for myself, but I wanted something that was easy to take care of. And I, we, we were at the zoo and I was like, oh, a snake. That, that seems maybe it's easy. Maybe they're cool. So I did some research and I was like, oh, yeah, I really want to snake. 
Um, went through a few different species because I wasn't really sure what I wanted and I wanted to make sure I got what, you know, something really cool. And I kind of looked at corn snakes like briefly. I was like, those look too easy. <laughs> so I, I kind of skipped over them at first. <laughs> But then, like, I saw how many colors they came in, and I was like, okay, yeah, maybe I want some of those. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I, I did some looking to see, like, you know, kind of what the morphs were that were available and, like, what I wanted. Um, and I, I got a cayenne fire from Don Soderberg. That was my first sneak. Whoa. So you actually went and you did it all out and you went legit. Yep. And Yep. And I mean, I, I like to say that I, I wasn't really planning on breeding originally, but like, honestly, in the back of my mind, I probably was because like, you know, it was, it was pretty cool male. So I've got some of his kids around. Yeah. I think, uh, especially going to that kind of source for your first corn snake, when you can go to literally any pet store in the country. Yeah. The price was pretty high. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Even like his, you know, just big basic morphs or they're a little pricey, <laughs> but like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I wanted the best and everybody said he was the best. So that's what I went with. So. There you go. As for me, uh, in, I think it was first grade, I brought a corn snake in for show and tell. And I've, I've had corn snakes pretty much all of my, all of my life uh, from when I was say like in first grade or so um, on and off, but I was never really into it that hardcore until I was probably about 20, 21 years old. And when I got back from the army and I was just kind of looking at things because I think I had just had a thing in particular when this happened, I had just had a surgery and I was in bed for, for quite a while. And I was just thinking about a bunch of different things and I saw corn snakes and I was like, wait a second, like I have this orange corn snake, but there's purple corn snakes <laughs> and there's like yeah. black and white corn snakes. Now, maybe not black and white forever. I didn't know that sure. at the time. Yeah. Oh, but, we uh, all made that mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, will it stay like that? No. Uh, okay. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, I, I really got into all the different colors of it. I went to ball pythons first because I was like, wait a second. These are like what all the cool kids are doing. Mm -hmm. Like there, there's a lot of cool corn snakes. But then I learned once I got really more into the snake community, I was like, wait a second. Everyone's doing these ball python things. So I kind of jumped on the bandwagon. And you know how that goes. Uh, oh. I guess for some of us it sticks. I wanted to, and then I just it just never happened, and I'm kind of glad it didn't because like I don't. I mean, I like ball pythons, but like I don't love ball pythons. Like it can okay. still get you at one. like the weirdest He's, time. Yeah, I mean, like there's some morphs that I just really, 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 really like. Like I'll see stuff from like you know Justin Kabilka, and I'm like, damn, I need that. But then. Uh, I don't, don't really. I have one ball python. He's a normal. He's from PetSmart. He was a, you know, surrender. So he's fine. He's, he's enough ball python for me, I think. So. Yeah, I forget. I forget who it was. But recently I was talking to someone and they're like, oh, I got a clown and a het clown or something. Like, man, you've had snakes for like 10 years. You didn't think about yeah. getting a clown before. It just sneaks up on people sometimes. Sometimes. I don't know. Yeah, but I, I went through that and I got out of that. And then I realized what I really enjoy is corn snakes. So I had, when I first got into corn snakes, I bought actually an annery, an adult annery female off of Ben Siegel, which <laughs> off of a, wow. an auction. So I don't think, I wouldn't <laughs> suggest that to be uh, your first move is to buy an auctioned adult female. But it, I mean, it worked out for me. I still have her upstairs. But uh, that's who I made my first. And I had my my corn snake, Tony, who is an AML. And mm -hmm. I was like, I want to make snows one day. Whoa. And uh, <laughs> one day. <laughs> one day. Yeah. So, oh, um, so I had Tony from when I was in middle school. And I bred them together and made babies. And then that was really that. So were what was the first? Were you surprised at getting normals? Or did you expect it by then? Oh, no. I knew how the genetics worked. Okay. Okay, because yeah, some people yeah. don't. I see that all the time. Like every year, I see people who are just like, I'm going to buy this and this recessive gene. I'm going to breed them together and I'm going to get this. And I'm just like, oh, honey, <laughs> you got a ways. <laughs> Give it the another three of, or years or so. 
the amount of research I do before I make any buying decision is egregious. So, yeah. So yeah, any anything I anything I get, I really think way too hard about, and therefore I do about all the genetics and stuff like that. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that kind of works out for us in this particular instance. Yeah. Well, most of the time it's because I don't just have the cash to just drop on it right now, so I'm gonna obsess yes. over it for a few months, and then, you know, hi guys, I see you in chat. I think I think particularly <laughs> everyone loves your ears. But yeah, I, I I was like, my hair is a mess, and I don't have time to shower. It's spooky season. I'm gonna wear the ear, the ear hat. This is like one go. of my favorite hats. I've had it for years. So the it's chat, I thought, gross. I thought it was definitely like a white-tailed deer, but the guy in the chat thought it was a fennec fox. Um, so we need clarification. Coyote was what I was. Oh, for. We're it was custom wrong. colors, and I just kind of picked from what they had available. Um. You know, I, I think the site that I got this from has like a whole bunch of new styles now that like all these different colors and patterns and, you know, fabrics and stuff that you can get. This was like, you know, maybe 2007, maybe oh, earlier yeah. than that. I don't know. It's, it's a pretty old hat. So it, it used to be like really soft and fluffy. And um, my ex accidentally washed it. Yeah, That's why you broke up. That was the tipping was, point. It was one of many reasons, but yeah. <laughs> it was or, no, it funny. was the hat and the wash. That was it. <laughs> that was the straw. That was it. So, um, as far as getting your animal home, did you initially keep in racks? I mean, did you have the idea to kind of keep that breeder style, or would you keep it? Kind of. Um, I did a tub. Um, I figured, you know. I'll do kind of a medium sized tub. So that way it's, you know, bigger than like a 10 gallon, but not quite like huge. And it was just on a dresser um, that now has a 40 gallon paludarium. Um, it's amazing the way that thing can hold. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I kept it, you know, breeder style. And like the first cages that I bought after that were racks. Um, I bought like a six high from Animal Plastics. So that's, I kind of just had that, from the start because it, it seemed you know efficient and simple um i i almost wish i had gone with like the tanks and lights and and had some experimentation with that just because i'm starting to lean more towards liking lights and like wanting halogen bulbs and uvb and like all this other like naturalistic keeping stuff and it's kind of tough to do when you've got like all these snakes already in racks and they're just taking up all the space you have already. <laughs> so, Yeah, I guess we expanded to our snake rooms in rack form. So now that we have all these snakes, we can't exactly keep them at a hundred percent the way that we want to, because we've already committed to this style of keeping in which is a lot more compact. Now I think there is a way to switch, but what I have in mind might be a little controversial to some people because I have been thinking about mm. cohabiting, but I've been thinking about cohabiting in very large enclosures with multiple females together and then single males and smaller ones by themselves. Um, kind of the, uh, like the Applegate style. Um, I've been looking at a, a cage maker called Scalebox. Um, he's doing that sort of drawer style that Bob Applegate made, you know, back in the, forever ago I don't, I don't know what year it was i was probably not even born <laughs> you were definitely not born i, was, I, I don't think so <laughs> this, this was a long time ago ancient corn snake history but um i would love to do you know big enclosures with lighting and you know different types of heat um but i think to do that space i would have to cohab and and i i think it's doable i i think you can give them you know the appropriate space and you know it's it's just gonna take some effort. So, so what I'm not would you... I'm not looking to cohab to make life easier or to take shortcuts. Trust me, I think it would be harder. <laughs> so, yeah. No, yeah, it definitely adds a layer of complexity to the whole mm -hmm. situation, especially with feeding. So, My yeah. girls are voracious. They will come <laughs> flying at the tub. They 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 literally will come flying out at you. Yeah, yeah, especially depending on time of year. But what do you what do you ask as far as your customers go? What do you typically recommend for caging for them? Um, because babies grow so fast, I do recommend you know just starting with a tub. Um, 
if you have a 10 gallon already, by all means, get a little, you know, a little lamp. Um, do it that way. Uh, I like the, um, I can't remember what it's called now. I have one on a 10 gallon. Um, but it's like a little halogen light and it's got that little tiny, like the micro UV bulb. And it's the perfect size for a 10 gallon tank. People always say, oh, you can't get a proper temperature gradient in a 10 gallon tank. You can't really get a good gradient, but it, it's functional. Like it's perfectly fine for like a corn steak. Um, so I, I would do something like that. Um, if you want to just do like a plastic top, I'm sorry, I keep like, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, if, if you want to do like a, a plastic tub with a heat mat, it's fine. I mean, like they'll be fine. Um, you know, especially temporarily, and then just move them up into something bigger as they grow. Um, plastic tubs are cheap, so it's an easy way to give them lots of space without spending a lot of money, and then you can upgrade to something really cool. Um, you could just put a baby in an adult enclosure, too. I mean, it's an option. It's really hard to find them. That's that's usually the downside. <laughs> so. Yeah, usually, I think that I usually goes recommend for... starting small just for the sake of being able to find your hatchling. Yeah, I think that goes for most of the people that ask are, or at least when they get home, even if they have that 10 gallon. And when I when I do have customers that want to use a tank in which I don't not recommend a tank if you as long as honestly, I the sliding top is yeah. crucial to me. I mean, mm -hmm. a regular a regular 10 gallon tank for whatever reason, it seems as though baby corn snakes always find their way out of it. They always do. If you have one that just like sits on top, they'll find that corner. They always, always do. Uh, I had one customer that did not tell me um, they were using a Velcroed on screen as mm -hmm. a top on their 10 gallon. So when she took it home, it, I mean, just immediately escaped. Yeah. So it, I don't think she ever found it. And I was just like, why did you think that was a good idea? And she's like, well, we pressed on it and it didn't move. And I'm like, did you try pulling on it? <laughs> Cause he's going to be pushing from the inside. So <laughs> yeah, they were just like, Oh, <laughs> uh, yikes. Yeah. And I think, and I think that's probably the biggest thing with all new corn snake keepers is that you lose your first hatchling or something like that. So yeah, it's, uh, it happens way too often. I've lost babies. Yeah. I've had, I still like, lose you know. babies. You know, it's still like when you feed recently. Well, even in Tupperware the other week, um, literally last week, actually, I was feeding and uh, Jeremy, who cleans, who cleans the enclosures. And actually, I feed on Tuesday night. He'll come over Wednesday morning and he'll check to see if if they ate. And uh, mm -hmm. he's like, yep, a corner was up on this one and the pinky's still in there and the snake's not. And I'm like, fuck me. I forgot another fucking corner of a tub it happens every once in a while on the even on the little tupperwares see that's why i like the drawer system like i have a i will um, leave that a little crack too though i am mm, uh maybe it's me yes. maybe it's just mm. me i'm the issue <laughs> must be <laughs> i don't know but yeah i the only issues i've had have been um keeping them in like a bigger rack where there was a little too much space and they got mm. out like through the back it's like ugh. Um, I've had babies get away from me and like climb under racks, but I can usually get them out. It's just a matter of patience. So um, I had uh, one very annoying little hatchling get under the I-10 that I have. And there's like, there's like this much clearance and that's it. It's just, it's the sides are all solid, but it can just get in there and get in the back. So I had to like carefully get a hook and like try to you know kind of nudge it towards the front where I could grab it. So that was half hour of stress. <laughs> yeah. With the, the babies is tricky. When I first moved into this house, I didn't realize that like there's some space between the baseboards and the floor. It's very old. Yeah. And uh, baby got out of my hand essentially, or I was feeding wow. it and it jumped out of the tub or, and then it like immediately went to this hole underneath the baseboard and the, and the floor you know, like, where they are it's like they can always find that one spot and it's like Every i didn't time. know about this that's wild and it just went right to it so uh yeah i mean they can be tricky just keep them under wraps yeah uh, that's my that's my biggest thing but yeah i think uh to me i feel like a lot of species you're always worried about at least ball python people say you know you don't go too big for a baby it won't eat for corn mm -hmm. snakes i don't see that issue at all no 
I, I'll have teeny tiny little hatchlings will eat giant pinkies. So it's like just uh, get something that's inescapable. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, yeah, teeny teeny tiny holes they can kind of squeeze their way out of. Ball pythons are kind of bad at. I mean, they're they're good at escaping, but like, I don't know. They just they have those blocky heads that just a much more manageable everything. kind yeah. of size. Yeah. yeah. So what about heating? I mean, what temps are you typically going for? Um, so for the babies, I do keep them a few degrees hotter than the adults. Um, I try to keep the back of the tubs around 85. Um, kind of just helps with digestion. And usually hatchlings are born in like the heat of summer. So they have warmer temperatures to help them kind of digest. Um, but yeah, I mean, most of my snakes, like the heat doesn't even turn on because it stays so warm upstairs. Um, but I think most of my racks are set to like 82 degrees. So for the, the internal, so it's actually set a little higher, but you know. So is that the ambience usually high? So you're almost always kind of using ambient heating. Almost. Yeah. It just, it stays so warm. I mean, especially in the summer, like we just, we don't have very efficient heat. So because the snakes are all upstairs, all heat rises up there. So yeah, it stays toasty. So, but it, in the winter, I mean, it, it'll get cold. Um, we usually try to keep the heat on. We, we've already turned the heat on a few times just because I've got the geckos upstairs. I don't have them on supplemental heat right now. So because it stays so warm in there, as long as we keep the temperature good in here, um, they're usually fine. So. Gotcha. So, I mean, I'm similar as far as 85 hotspot is what I always recommend, even if you're not yeah. keeping in an ambient situation. Um, maybe for babies a little bit. I mean, a, a lot of people, though, I hear, you know, they'll be like, oh, I have it at 92. It's like, no. Um, I always prefer to kind of go a little bit cooler unless the yeah. babies will definitely have some digestive problems. Yeah, my, my males especially, I keep them like lower in the rack where they won't get quite as much heat. Um, just because like I've had issues with males over overheating and like cooking sperm and they just don't produce well, at least that's what it seems like. And that's, you know, the story that I always hear from, you know, big producers. And I think you're, especially the people who are pumping out, you know, a few thousand a year, they probably know what they're talking about. And they so. probably have some incentive to be efficient about it. Yeah. So I just, I keep the males. A little bit lower in the racks and i for a while i was keeping them in a separate rack that had um i had it set to about 80 so instead of you know like 82 83 um but it still just gets so warm upstairs it, it really doesn't matter that much so i just keep them lower and hope that they you know don't overcook yeah <laughs> yeah i think the yeah the, obviously the biggest danger is getting them too hot right yeah yeah Definitely. Yeah. Heat is way more dangerous for, for snakes in general than, you know, being slightly too cool. Um, obviously you can have digestive problems, but aside from that, I think they can tolerate pretty cold temperatures. So. Yeah. I mean, especially colubrids, you're looking at animals yeah. who brew made at 55 degrees. So mm -hmm. I think that's always what I get. Uh, sometimes when I'm shipping, shipping babies out there, like he arrived cold. It's yeah, like, he arrived alive. That's uh, we really <laughs> wanted to. I yeah. really didn't want to put a heat pack in there because of a six, you know, a six by six by mm. seven inch package yeah. would get up to 100 degrees if it's, you know, 70 degrees out yeah. or something easily. Oh, yeah. Probably 110, 120. Real, who real knows? Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, yeah I always I, stay on the cool side of that stuff. I had uh, two shipments to California, one of which got delayed. Um, that was scary. Oh, boy. Um, well, uh, one of the people is in the chat. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I put some extra ice in there because <laughs> uh, it doesn't take much. So yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Those trucks are so hot. Yeah. And it's just the lack of control that you have over a package. You always got to be safe about every which way. Um, but I'm sure we'll talk more about that kind of stuff. Yeah. But um, heating wise, I mean, as far as my adults, I keep I keep my room typically 80 to 82. A lot of times it's more towards 82 and the babies are usually on the top shelf at like 84 or so. Yeah. Um, and that's ambient. Um, and that's swinging down to 82 now and the babies are doing just fine at that. But, um, but they're also established at this point and pretty much yeah. good to go. Yeah. Most of mine are, they've eaten quite a few meals. So we are. Yeah. Right now is yeah. kind of when we're separating the has from the has nots, if you yeah. will. Yeah, well, I mean, my only non-feeders, um, unfortunately, did not make it. Um, I, I don't know if I just wasn't 
force feeding them enough. I'm not sure. Or if just something was wrong. But I had three from the same clutch that just nothing. I didn't want to eat anything. I tried all the tricks. Nah. So, so that was unfortunate. Um, but, uh, and then I had, I had one fail to thrive recently, but otherwise everybody's been getting fat. Yeah. <laughs> my, my first clutch to hatch that I, I mean, I, I have only sold a few, so like I still have, I have lots of babies. If anybody wants a corn snake, please, please. <laughs> windserpents.com um <laughs> i may have more i i may have some peach stuff uh, available soon because i i can't hold them all like i i just can't so <laughs> i have way too many way too many you're getting too many geckos mm -hmm. no i did um yeah i i <laughs> I, I went from i want a gecko yeah, as yeah. a pet to buying 10 wholesale with a friend so yeah we uh we split it up. She technically owns half of them, but then I got a freebie, so I have eleven. Ooh. So yeah, we took it to eleven. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> Things escalate quickly with people like us. They really do. Yeah. So feeding wise, um, how do you kind recommend of childish to have on a goofy head cap, right? Fuck you. It's Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> I think our uh, the way we treat these kind of comments when you when you say dumb shit is go fuck yourself. Yeah. I think, uh, mm -hmm. although like, thanks for watching, but like, don't yeah. be a dick about it. Yeah. This is Stick free. Around. Yeah. I mean, like you don't have to watch us, but Hey, but kind of childish Laura. So, um, <laughs> so okay. there is an entire chair full of stuffed animals and all kinds of other like kid crap. So, you know, whatever. And Don't here we me. thought, here we thought <laughs> that this whole corn snake thing was only for adults and an adult audience. And Aww. here you are bringing it down a, a peg. Absolutely. I have plushies sitting above my computer too. There you go. Tell them. So um, as far as feeding goes, <laughs> when you have a customer's um, for a baby, uh, how often do you recommend feeding and how do you recommend feeding? Um, so usually like, you know, once a week is typically fine. Um, you're not going to get a lot of like, you know, heavy growth rate, but like, honestly, a, a once a week is fine, you know, um, especially somebody with their first pet, you don't, you're not, not looking to breed. Um, you know, I tell people if they want to feed slightly more often, they can, but just be careful. Um, and I know all the, the major charts will say to feed every like four or five days and I've done that. Um, it works out Okay. But I noticed that if I feed too quickly and I don't have the heat high enough, mm -hmm. I start to get regurges. So I, I usually tell people just err on the side of caution, just do once a week. It's easy to keep a schedule. So that way, if you have, you know, one day a week that you feed, you know, it's, it's easy to remember. So and then, you know, if you forget, like, don't freak out, just just skip a week. It's fine. <laughs> that is, that is a funny <laughs> thing fun. with, <laughs> with, uh, whether it's new keepers or just when you even talk to keepers who are, uh, oh, they stress very out about adamant it. about the schedule. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, they have, to, it has to be this many days, this exact size mouse. And it's like, just relax. It's Chill a burn out, snake. Okay. It'll be fine. <laughs> like <laughs> they are the stretchiest, hardiest little rat <laughs> snakes ever. Like they're, they're fine. They will be fine. Yeah, so even I found, I mean, my babies now, they've been on seven, you know, every seven days is what I do. Uh, maybe to get them going in the beginning when I'm just getting over all the hatching and stuff, I'll go every four to five days just to make sure that we can get three feedings in there and I can get I can get kind of animals moving before more animals hatch out and all that stuff. I started um, to do that, but I just, I couldn't keep up with it. Oh, it's it. impossible it's, to keep up. That's why yeah, I stopped after the so, beginning. Yeah. So. But yeah, I find that like some of mine that are being fed every seven days are kind of getting a little chunky now by this yeah. time of year. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it, honestly, if you like, especially if you're like looking to breed, feeding them twice a week when they're hatchlings is is probably the best way to get growth onto them. You know, once you can get them out of that delicate hatchling stage and onto like fuzzies, then you can slow things down, you know, and people always freak out They're like, oh, no, that's power feeding. You don't want to do that. You're going to get that fat snake. And it's like, no, just do it for a little while and then slow it down before they hit adults, you know, and then they're not going to, they're not going to get fat. They'll be fine. 
Yeah, I feel like uh, it's kind of hard to get a point the cross or to get the point across that mm -hmm. of what a healthy body shape is and what isn't. Yeah. So, and then also like I have different animals that respond to feeding schedules in different ways. I have animals that I fed the same exact feeding schedule that look a little bit different. So there is no absolutes. I wish I could tell you like here, now, then this size, what's going on. But I mean, just like human beings, just like any other living thing. I mean, they all have different, different genetic potentials and different things that can, that can definitely. Happen. Yeah. I mean, I've got some snakes that I could probably feed three times a week and they'd be perfectly happy with that. Um, and then I've got others that if I fed them more than once a week, they just throw it up. So, you know, every, every snake's individual, you kind of got to, got to learn, you know, what's, what's good for your animals. So, um, and, and for me, I gain weight so easily, especially males. I see so many fat males. Absolutely. And I, I feel like, um, as far as feeding goes, I always try to go on the side of smaller instead of bigger. Mm -hmm. Cause like, yeah. All right. What happens if you feed something that's too small? You know, you feed them next digest week faster. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? What happens when you feed something too big? It regurges and can turn into a chronic and problem. It's gross. And it it's smells so like gross. something different. Just yeah. It's not. It's worse than death. Like there's <laughs> there's dead mouse smell and then there's regurge smell. It is a whole different level. Yeah. It's that. Just, ugh. Yeah, I'm so not it's easily like grossed always, out and it just gets to me. Yeah, I always and I always try to kind of go on the side of not having that ever happen. Um, so this is a very, very and I think me and Laura both talked about this. Uh, this is a chart that a lot of people use this feeding chart here. The infamous Munson plan. <laughs> and I think it, you know, I think it is good, but feeding double pinks every four to five days sounds yeah, that's a bit a much. little nuts. <laughs> um, so I do double pinks uh, before I do fuzzies. So like, there's nothing wrong with doing two feeders at a time. Honestly, even three feeders sometimes is okay. But you, once again, you really got to know your animals. Um, but like, I, I do double pinks once a week, not every four days. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that's huge as far as um, not being afraid to double it up before moving up to the big size because mm -hmm. I have found that things like regurg usually happens with the big size. So you can get just as much as far as gram weight in the animal with two pinks as you could a small fuzzy mm -hmm. and they'll digest it easier. Yeah, I've definitely seen that moving up to hoppers because the skin starts to get thicker as you get more of that fur coat um, and like large fuzzies. So, you know, sometimes feeding like two small fuzzies or two, two like, you know, peach fuzzies is better than moving to hoppers right away just to kind of get them used to like that larger meal. Um, and then you can also do, uh, I don't know, who did I learn that from? Kathy Love, I think. No, Connie Hurley. Um, cutting the backs uh, with like a pair of sharp scissors or a scalpel. Um, it helps them digest it more like thoroughly um because the the like stomach juices can penetrate you know into the body cavity and actually digest it rather than having to work its you know way through the skin and the mo mouth and nose and eyes and stuff like that um i've had really really good success uh cutting pinkies i i don't right now because i'm lazy <laughs> it, takes, it takes so much time yeah. it's so so much work and yeah they're they usually can digest it just fine but if if you're worried that you know, you're moving up to a new, new size. Um, just take like a pair of scissors and cut a couple of snips across the back. Don't do the belly because the intestines will all spill out. It's really gross. Don't, don't make that mistake. I made that mistake. <laughs> I accidentally cut too far and it was just everywhere. Like, ugh, <laughs> it was gross. It was so gross. Um, but yeah, that, that can, can help things. Um, do you ever move to rats? No. Not with corn Not really. Snake. It's just, it's, I don't know what it is because like on paper, nutritionally, they're pretty equivalent. They're really not that much different. They're a little higher in protein. Um, a lot of people say, oh, they're higher in fat. They're really not. They're not actually that higher, much higher in fat. And I think they actually have more calcium. Um, but for whatever reason, they seem to increase weight gain a lot. 
if you overdo it. If you do it occasionally, that's fine. They'll be totally fine. Um, I will occasionally give like rat pups to, especially to my breeding females to help them gain weight. Um, but to, I would not do rats as a staple. I would do it as a treat. So um, if you do feed rats, I recommend adding quail because those are very lean, um, very high fiber because all the feathers that will kind of balance it out. Um, and that gives your snake some, you know, variety. So maybe any nutrients that it might be missing from the rodents, it might get from the birds. Yeah, so that's something I've been looking to implement is maybe getting some chicks and stuff. And I've heard that um, some farms will have chicks even a lot cheaper than, yep. say, the rodents that we get. So that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, it, male, it makes sense in every which way. Calls. Yep. Yeah, so and then also... Um, with the with the mouse cutting, I want to make sure that people know that like Connie actually did like a full write up, like an actual paper in which she mm -hmm. had hatchlings that weren't slit, hatchlings that were, and the hatchlings that were slit digested better and actually grew more, um, just because they were able to digest everything mm -hmm. more. Uh, it was more available to them. So, yeah, that that's not just, just like observation. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. She she. I mean, it was it was a pretty small study, so like I would like to see that repeated with a larger number. I just don't have the numbers to really you know do anything more significant than that. Um, but yeah. So Allison asked, "Do you ever dust with calcium or vitamins, and how often?" I do occasionally. Um, I haven't been as much lately. Uh, I probably should do so more. But usually I, you hear all kinds of different numbers. Some people say do it every time. Some people say do it once a month. I really don't know what the best is. So I'm kind of just guessing. Um, you know, I will occasionally like, you know, just kind of dip the butt. You know, I'll sprinkle some in a, like a little plastic container and then just like dip the butt in. Um, some of my snakes absolutely will not eat anything that's dusted. So I just... I don't know. I, I got lazy with it. I haven't really done that much, but I definitely um, use calcium with my females uh, in this, like in the spring. Um, I think that that had a big impact this year. Um, I had way better eggshells. So I, I definitely recommend that for females, for breeding females. So that's something that I haven't really done. And I know that that, that, that was a huge thing, especially if you, I think you look at the, the loves corn snake book. I think they talk a little bit about that and mm -hmm. that they've experimented with it, but I've it's even, nothing. I've even experimented with adding um, carotenoids um, because of a paper that I read. I don't even remember what it said, but it had something about um, like egg formation, that there was some kind of benefit for um, birds and, um, you know, birds being reptiles and all that. Um, thought maybe there'd be some correlation. It, I, I figured it can't hurt at the worst. So um, I actually was supplementing this year and I had good clutches. So, you know, I have no idea if there's any correlation, but. So I have found it. that, um, especially for when I get those like half calcified eggs, the ones that I don't know, you've probably had those eggs that are a little bit dimpled. Mm -hmm. They have those weird kind of spots on them. Mm -hmm. uh, I have found that those are usually my females that are maybe eating less prey or a little bit smaller prey. Same. So maybe, and that, you know, maybe that's a calcium thing too. They're just more bone density and stuff and the other animals. But, uh, but yeah, I've been thinking of, uh, cause I've been messing with a lot of house plants and people, yeah, a super pig as a supplement, people, right. um, super pig. Yeah. The Crested gecko supplement. Ah, so yeah, that was, that was what I, how I was adding carotenoids. So, huh, I didn't know that. So that's pig as in pigment. So that's supposed to bring yeah, out the rapashi. pigment in some certain animal. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the rapashi. Um, yeah, it's just kind of a blend of of like flower petals and stuff. Basically, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the kind of thing that might be in like a mouse's stomach. So hmm. you know, I, it seems I see. Reasonable. Yeah, I thought it was worth a try. So I'll probably yeah. repeat that next year. So people in the plant community, they um, boil eggshells, say, mm -hmm. and then put a little bit of water their plants with, with eggshells mm -hmm. to get calcium. So it's like, hey, yeah. why yeah. doesn't someone boil some eggshells and maybe put it in the female's water bowl every, you know, during breeding season or something? Maybe that's one way to supplement. Maybe they won't eat, drink the water. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know about doing that in the water, 
Um, you could get bone meal and just dip sure. like a wet mouse into it. It might, you know, add a little bit. Um, I've wondered about adding that to like reptilinks if there would be any drawbacks like if you can overdo it with bone you probably can i mean i know like with dogs if you overdo it with like prey model raw um they can get like constipated so i don't know it's probably not something you want to do too much experimenting with but you know i've had good luck with with reptilinks with corn snakes but also at the same time i'd never fed something that was probably an appropriate size so say like right it wasn't as big as a as a large mouse because sure. it's so nutritionally dense, mm -hmm. ground down. Yeah. And like, you know, whole prey ground down is gonna be more dense in that sausage form than if you were just feeding a mouse. Yeah. Oh yeah. At yeah, least that I was my removes, I think it removes some of the water content a little bit. Cause I imagine you would lose some from just evaporation like during the grinding process. So but yeah. yeah. Much respect yeah, I meant, to I meant however like, they're ground. I meant like adding bone meal to reptilinks, but yeah. 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 So as far as um, supplementation and stuff like that, is that all you're working with? Are you, uh, I think we're both kind of thinking about things like UV and stuff like that. Um, yeah. I haven't, I haven't been able to do anything with lights. I'd like to. Um, what I really want to do, and I've talked about this a few times with some people is I want to build just like a huge bioactive cage. I think I mentioned this to you at one point. Um, really big, like walk-in bioactive cage with like a tree and like a bunch of stuff and like nice lights and just be able to rotate my female corn snakes in and out of that so that they have room to exercise and hang out together if they want to or get away from each other if they want to. You know, I want it to be big enough that they have their own space. Um, but that way they're, you know, getting some of that climbing and they're moving more rather than just, you know, sitting stagnant in a tub. Um, I think that that will help a lot with, you know, egg production and avoiding egg binding, you know, if they're actually able to work those muscles. So, but that's, that requires not an apartment. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a, that's a someday project. I just need to make a corn snake room. I think it would be really interesting, though, to do like those Applegate style cages where he had, you know, six or eight that were all connected. Mm. Just, you know, let them go wherever they want to. And then, you know, they got more room to roam. I can give them, you know, climbing branches and all kinds of stuff, but still use up kind of the same space. So I don't know. There, there's some ideas rattling around in, in there. Somewhere. Yeah, I'm I'm curious just like if they would choose to we'd probably be surprised how often they choose to just all be clumped together. Yeah. And then how often they choose I don't know, it'd be interesting. I think so. I mean, you know, we, we see snakes cohabbing and it's it's easy to anthropomorphize, but on the other hand, it's easy to go the other way and be like, oh no, they're stressed. And most of the time they're probably not. They're probably just in the same spot because it's warm and they don't really care if they're together. I mean, we find snakes together in the wild all the time, curled up together, different species. You know, you'll find garters and rattlesnakes together. And it's like, they don't care. Like they're not bothered, but like, you know, so yeah. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I don't know. It's kind of weird how many things we have had go taboo. So say, Things like keeping animals in too large of enclosures. Mm -hmm. um, that was, and now I feel like maybe, I mean, it's like kind of a myth now, even though when, when I was getting into it and I think uh, maybe people had felt this, maybe the, the herpers of the, of the early nineties, I felt it's about the hot rock. Like, wait a second, mm -hmm. we had this, then we lost it and things yeah. are different now. Now well, I feel like the large enclosure thing is kind of that way for us. Yeah. It's, it's definitely coming back. Um, some of that pushback was from like early in the hobby with ball pythons in particular, because like they'd put them in these big fish tanks and then they wouldn't eat like ball pythons were notorious for just not eating. Nobody wanted them. Um, it wasn't until people started keeping them in racks and getting them, you know, figuring out how to get them to breed that people actually wanted them. Um, but when they were first available, like it's just, that was the, that was the issue and people would put them in these big cages. So that became the standard of, oh, well, if you put it in a smaller cage, it will eat. 
And so that's, that has kind of trickled into other species. And it, it generally works, um, you know, with, with, I mean, even with cooler birds, if you put them in a smaller cage, they're more likely to find the food quickly. But I mean, honestly, like they, they don't have to be in these tiny cages. Like they, they really don't. <laughs> They will do just fine in a, a big sprawling cage with lots of room to climb and and bask and just you know be everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So I think that um, also something that I miss in the feeding portion is I always kind of recommend people to feed because uh, they're usually maybe crepuscular at this age. Even in our homes, since we're active during the day, I think they usually are nocturnal. They kind of try to avoid us. So mm -hmm. I always I always say to feed. Uh, you know, if you want to leave it in there at like 6 p.m. and keep it yeah. in there overnight. I typically um, try to feed in the evening. Um, lately, I've I've had to feed kind of in the afternoon because like, you know, we spend time in the evening. So like you know, if I start eating until like our time, it, uh, it's just it's not cool. Um, so <laughs> so like, I'll, you know, I'll feed them late afternoon. Um, you know, I don't do like morning feeds, but yeah, I mean, especially with my my Solomon Island tree boa. You know, when it's nighttime, you don't stick your hand in there. <laughs> she will bite it. <laughs> but I think she'll do that any time of day now because she's figured out that I, I am the bringer of food. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anybody comes in, it's just plonk right against the glass. Just, no, it's not food time yet. Calm down. Yeah. So I think, I think as far as feeding too, we can talk kind of about, well, let's talk about breeding. Then we'll kind of get into problem feeders and stuff oh, like God. that. So. <laughs> I know we're getting flashbacks just thinking about it. So Sipping little mouse legs down their throats. Yeah. It's always an interesting time of year. Yeah. It's so, for me, it's it's around now. So um but it um was for me, but yeah, you know. Breeding anyway. wise, um, what age are you looking for? I mean, I, I know for me, usually age for females, I'm looking for at least three and males at least two. Are you the same way? Yeah, um, I know people say that it's it's more about size, but honestly, I think that you get better results if you wait. Um, I think that even just waiting until four for some females is better because you're going to get more consistent, larger clutches. Um, I have some females that I've grown kind of slow and, you know, they're going to be four next year and they might be up to size, maybe. Um, so I, I don't know, like I... I, I've gone back and forth on this because I used to be like, you know, yeah, just feed it, you know, feed to breed and, you know, feed it, you know, big so that, you know, they can handle the eggs. But I've just, I've had better results, especially from like older males, like young males don't generally do that great. So, um, but yeah, so like at, most least, of at us. least three years, I would say for a female, I mean, just at least yeah, try to, I mean, if you happen to have a two year old, that's just like, surprisingly massive maybe give it a shot i mean if she's big you know worst that can happen is she might slug out at the very least if she's starting to gain too much weight it might help her lose some of that weight so you know um but to, for, even for the males i recommend waiting until they're older because you'll get better results just in general yeah. So I have, as far as females go, I've also waited that fourth year for certain animals. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely slow grow all of them. I think, I think a lot of that, you know, feed to breed type of mentality is because you're looking at how many eggs the animal lays. Mm -hmm. I think that was kind of a point yeah. of, you know, you show, you would show off on how many, how many eggs your female laid was how good of a breeder you were. At least in the basically. beginning. So it's like, I mean, I'm doing this the best if I right. have the most eggs. Well, I mean, some of it is just, you know, they need the production to like make a living. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. thinking of like wholesale breeders. I know people that, that that's what they do. They they breed A-Mills, a and and stuff for PetSmart and, you know, Petco and all those. And they have to keep track of those numbers. They have to, you know, kind of have a schedule for like females that are growing up. Um, but I think for, you know, the average hobbyist, have a little patience, you know, take it, take it easy. You know, you, you will probably have that female for a lot longer if you don't push her. So. 
Yeah, I think it's uh, at least what I see on a very short term basis as far as I've been doing this for only seven years, right? I mean, there's people who have been doing this for 30 years or something like yeah. that. Um, I have found that those females that you slow grow and you do them year after year, they are just, they're just steadily growing their clutch size or maybe they stay around 15 or so. Yeah. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm not seeing that like 30 eggs in a clutch, but I'm also, uh, I don't know. I see that they're very lively and good to go. And I feel like, I hope at least, at least that's the, the idea is that they live longer lives. So, yeah. Yeah. That's what I hope too. Um, yeah, I just, you know, you, you hear different things from different people and everybody. And I'm not disparaging exactly. Yeah, yeah. The other way of doing it, but um, I've also kind of had the situation in which the two year old males are kind of, it's like they don't, they just simply don't know what they're doing in a way yeah. in which, you know, even some of them will try to court and the mm -hmm. people just like, nah, like, dude, no. you don't know what yeah. the hell and is the, going on. The, they'll like overdo it. They like, I had one male that just <laughs> would like freak out. And I was like, calm down, buddy, dude, she just be chill. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> kind of reminds me of like the guys in high school. <laughs> That's what I say. It's completely parallel to human beings. Yeah. It's like a 16 year old just throw, throwing him in the ring. And he's yeah. like, oh, I don't know on? what to do with myself. <laughs> so, yeah. And then um, I have I found have... that um, like putting that, that three year old male in mm -hmm. with the female and then the two year old, I feel like it makes her a little bit more receptive and it may actually work out. I don't know if you'll get as much fecundity, but I have had them lock after having an older male in there. But then again, like that older male usually sticks. That's he usually yeah. gets the clutch anyway. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, I try, I try them out, but usually, yeah, for the most part, mm -hmm. no dice. Yeah. I had, I had the opposite happen um, this year. I had two different males that I bred to one female and it was the younger one that got the job done. I was interesting. Um, wasn't expecting that but you know, got some nice babies. So, and I proved out another het for my sun kiss that was a complete unknown. She's het ghost Motley. <laughs> nice. So, yeah. I mean, that's really, uh, if you're going to have, if you're going to have something pop up, I found that it's mostly Motley. Yeah. It's, it's always Motley. Never stripe. Never be stripe. Yeah, always Motley. I don't, I don't, I like stripe better than Motley. Uh, it's fine. Um, but yeah, I, I had one, um, he wasn't really young. He was just really small. Um, I have this itty bitty, teeny, 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 tiny, uh, coral. He was like a neon and coral line mixed, uh, snow that What's I brought to. So neon was a line of coral snow that was known for having like these green borders like the, mm. the saddle borders. Mm -hmm. So like they were like pink and green, like the best ones were really just really cool. Um, I don't know many people that are working with that line anymore, but he has some of that, that green in, in his saddles. And so does his sister. Um, but he's just a teeny itty bitty little guy. He did not grow very fast at all. I, maybe I'm underfeeding my males. I don't know. I feed them light. So, but I, <laughs> he, he got the job done. Like, I, I put him in with this female thinking he was going to just bolt for the door and uh, he got, he got right to it. And then like they separated and immediately locked again. And I was like, okay, I guess you're staying on as a breeder. So I'm going to hold on to that male for sure. Um, beautiful clutch, beautiful babies, big babies, big, big hatchlings. <laughs> Sassy as can be. Um, I know somebody was asking about anneries. I think that was Aurora. Um, yeah, they're they're not friendly. I'll I'll warn you. <laughs> they don't like people. <laughs> oh, yours. Give them in, time. They yours will eventually. In particular. Yeah, no, these ones in particular. I they get they got their dad sass when he was a baby. He was just a little asshole, and now all the babies are little assholes. So. Yeah, I have those clutches too, in which some of them just take <laughs> after a particular parent, and they yeah. just and year after year they come out just. Different. extremely defensive for yeah. a course like what the mm -hmm. hell are you doing that's yeah. all my miami okatees they're yeah. absolutely nuts but uh okatees and sunkiss okatees in general yeah yeah sunkiss also have this well sunkiss come from okatees right that's true that is true um so so do lavas i think 
and I've heard lavas have some attitude as well. I don't know. Hmm. Mine were a little off as baby. I, I did have one big male that was just horrible. You couldn't handle him. <laughs> he was he was not friendly. <laughs> That's not like, like it's hard because corn snakes for the most part. I mean, I would say 95% mm -hmm. of them into adulthood. Oh, yeah. You just don't really have to worry about them at all. Mm, no, most of them are chill as can be. This one was just the devil. You so. get a few psychopaths. I mean, it's yeah. just a matter of uh, percentages. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> so, and uh, sometimes you have all those whole clutches. And then if someone, if you have a responsible owner who handles the animal every once in a while, I, yeah. they come down over time. I, I always try to give people a heads up when I have hatchlings that are like extra defensive so mm -hmm. you know that way they're fully prepared to get bit because they're gonna get bit. <laughs> they're like that picture is so good and i'm like mm -hmm. the picture is yeah. really good because it stays still because it wants to bite me the whole time oh. so just you know mm -hmm. just be warned <laughs> yeah i've got lots of pictures on there that they are very much in a defensive stance yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are not being friendly they're fighting for their lives they think that camera is going to eat them <laughs> Absolutely. And I think uh, to kind of backtrack, I think that the big takeaway is kind of, uh, I mean, try out, you know, try out your breeders as far as I'm never afraid yeah. to like throw a male in there with a female and kind of see what happens. There are some pairings I would be hesitant to do, but I mean, for the most part, yeah. I mean, as long as they've got, you know, matching genetics, um, I've made way too many normals, het fruit salad for my liking. <laughs> so that's, that's what I call it. After like four heads, it's like, it's fruit salad. Like, it's just, who knows what you're going to get. Could be yeah. anything. You yeah. should have told me that a few years ago. I got, I got a lot of, uh, het lava terrazzo. With a bunch of like pos heads. Amel diffused oh, caramel pos heads. So, <laughs> like, yes. the fuck am I doing with my life? Yeah. No, I've I've done that too. So, so yeah, it's a lot of work to make red snakes, you know. Someone's got to do it, though. If you mix all the genes, you just get white. I I could only be so lucky, <laughs> you know. Hey, at least people like white snakes. That's especially what I'm China. saying, dude. Especially China, like um, <laughs> normal Molly at fruit salad, yes. Um, yeah, I, I, apparently, um, in in China, there was like a legend about a, a beautiful woman who turned into a white snake. And so white snakes are really, really popular. That sells really, really well in certain parts of China. Um, so like all the exporters were trying to get all the like blizzards and stuff. That's why there were no blizzards. because They were all going overseas. Couldn't find them. Whiteouts? Nah, China. Yeah, they even like uh, blue-eyed leucistic rat snakes. I mean, I have some friends who breed those and they were all gone. Right. Yeah. Um, leucistic rainbow boas and stuff like that too. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're hot. We need some better folklore over here in the United States. I think, uh, you know, we need to kill it, chop its head off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, snakes in, in the US. Yeah, we need so something cool. a little bit more positive, like uh, that promotes red corn snakes, because yeah. we need that. But as far as breeding goes, um, I guess we can talk brumation and stuff because that's important. So before we even get to age and, and things like that, brumation. So I usually do Thanksgiving to Valentine's Day, and that's a very rough estimate because sometimes I'm lazy, sometimes I'm super excited. So, But I try to give at least that type of time frame. Uh, what do you do? Uh, I have never brumated. <gasps> you monster. Haven't, haven't done it, yes. I'm a terrible person. How dare you for I, doing I things differently? I don't really have a place to do it. You know, if I had like an outside closet – we have a garage, but like Ohio gets cold. Yeah. Like we get in the negatives a lot and I just don't feel safe trying. Um, you know, if we moved to a house, I would probably try having like a bedroom with the window cracked and like, you know, an oil heater in the center to try and keep the temperature right. But I, I, I would probably be freaked out the entire time. So um, I've thought about building like a little, you know, cooling box, like with a, you know, a, a little mini fridge with the door off, just attached to some like insulation foam and then just kind of pack everybody in there. It might work. I know people have done it, but uh, I don't really have anywhere to put it. So I'm going to have to just wait. So 
probably will not be able to roommate next year either. I think what's huge is that you're still able to do it. Cause I mean, a lot of people are actually nervous about that. I don't have a place in my uh, house, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, um, I get that question all the time. Like and, yeah. all over the place. <laughs> it's a mess. I would like to roommate. It would make things. I guess. Better. Yeah. It makes your clock a lot different. You don't know exactly when to expect certain times of the cycle yeah. to happen after uh usually after the first i just start throwing them in once a week and see what happens <laughs> and sometimes it takes months so yeah i think for for a lot of people i kind of explain brumation as kind of like a a hard reset yeah. so so i usually and to kind of backtrack on brumation itself it's 50 to 55 degrees even 50 to 60 is kind of where i keep them they're they're in the basement so they usually hover but mm -hmm. um usually keep them 50 to 60 from Thanksgiving to Valentine's day. I take them up maybe for a day. They're in normal room temperature 70 and then they go into up top 75 for a couple days and then they go into the room 80 degrees. I don't think that that's awfully important, but mm -hmm. after that I start once I get out of brumation brumation, I don't feed them at all. Right. Um, right. and then feeding, rather often, probably every four to five days for females coming out of brumation. So do you at least not going, not doing a brumation? Do you at least try to like do some type of feed cycling to try yeah. to get that going? Um, I actually will be doing that probably a little more strictly this year. Um, but I did last year. Um, I, I cut back feeding a lot. Um, I would feed twice a month. Uh, the males I would feed like once a month. So yeah, I, I slow them down. Um, I may cut the temperatures back a little bit. I don't know how much I'm going to be able to cool it off upstairs, especially with the geckos. Cause then I'm going to have to add supplemental heat to them. Um, we'll see, but yeah, I'll probably use feeding cycles. One, one thing that I've wanted to experiment for a while with, and I might find a way to do it is light cycles. Um, you know, reducing the photo period, um, to tell them like, Hey, you know, it's fall, even though it's not cold, it's fall. Um, I, I just got a, uh, um, like a little smart plug, uh, it was gifted to me, um, that I put on my boas enclosure. So now that's automatically set and it's, it's so easy. I, I feel like if I can just hook something like that up to a lamp in the snake room, which is really more of a closet, uh, it's the, the snake closet, um, that I think that might help but I don't know. So, you know, I don't think anything's going to replace brumation because I feel like that it, I don't know like what the physiological effect is, but I, I just, I don't know if it's going to do much. And I know that Kathy love kind of swore on, on light cycling. And that's yeah. something in which like, like you have a snake closet. I have had a snake closet too. And yeah. I kept that thing dark 24 seven and I bred in that. <laughs> so it's like they had zero I, life period. Yeah. No, I, I do turn the lights on. Um, during the but day. I think that there's definitely like those triggers, right? Yeah. Meaning like, you know, there's feeding, there's brumation, there's all these different triggers, there's light and you can kind of hit some of them and kind of, you know, you can get what you're going, where you're going. As far as you, you're not brew mating, but you're hitting, you may be hitting some of the other triggers. Yeah. Uh, at least that's what I'm hoping. Yeah. I mean, everybody was kind of close together ish. It was like over probably about a month and a half or so. So like I had clutches spaced out, which sometimes is kind of. Mine nice. still go in that range, by the way. Really? That's about my range anyway. Yeah. From first, from first lay to last lay, probably about a month, month and a half. It's not that important. Well, it see. may just be natural range. Yeah. If anything, it would just save me money because I wouldn't have to feed them at all. <laughs> <laughs> that is the Trust me, the more snakes I have, the more that just sounds wonderful. You start getting into other hobbies and shit. I mean, you don't have anything to do, so you're like, oh yes. yeah. Then I have more time for World of Warcraft. <laughs> so James oh, said. I blame this podcast yeah. on that, by the way, because World Alice, of Warcraft. Yes, Alice wow. in, the, in the chat. She saw my previous interview with you, and she was like, "Oh, did you name your your business after the the wind serpents in in WoW?" And I was like, "Yeah." And long story short, I now have like a whole bunch of characters in her guild. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it sounds pretty serious. <laughs> I, I level the character to max in about two weeks, so that was. I mean, it was double experience, so it's not very impressive, but. I don't know. It felt like an accomplishment to me. Anyway. <laughs> Someone I, knows exactly I, what you're talking I, I about. I blame you for that because that was, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So, so James asked, 
um, he bought a wine cooler for his Reber boa, mm -hmm. and he's going to brewmate them in a wine cooler. And I've heard that for corn snake breeders who try to do two seasons or something like that. They try to flip seasons and try to have snakes available at different times. So uh, some of the big um, like wholesalers do. That's what Reptiles by Mac does. They have like so many sets of, of cooler broods that get, uh, you know, put in at different times of the year. So they have babies all year round. Yeah, so I think something like a wine cooler, I mean, for someone on a small scale, it makes total oh, sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you've only got a couple, a wine cooler should be fine. It's just I've got too many to fit in a wine cooler <laughs> without having to just, like, pack, you know, 10 of them in one tub. Aurora wants to know, are you accepting more members yeah. into your game? Yes. Please help me. <laughs> you're, you're in the um, uh, Reach Out Reptiles Discord. You can message me. Oh, snap. You got all these. You already know these people. Oh yeah, no. I, I was I, wondering. Yeah, I get all these yeah. new people in the chat here. <laughs> Sorry, I, I guess I should have warned you. Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean that's. I mean, like, God forbid you bring around some people to watch the podcast. You know, I'm hoping that we just broadcast this to no one. But here we are. No, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I I've heard so many people say this is one of their favorite podcasts. So. Well, I tell those know. hundred people that there. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, uh, well, not about the thank you part, but um, so as far as we're breeding, all that stuff, brumation, you're pairing up. Mm -hmm. How many times do you, and listen, I don't really count how many times I, I pair. Okay. Yeah, Cause I like people ask me that all the time. Like, when do I stop pairing? I don't know, man, when they stop. When they stop breeding. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will just kind of throw a mail in and see what happens. I'll wait, you know, 10, 15 minutes, just see what, you know, what he does. Usually if they don't do anything in the first like 20 minutes, they're not going to breed. Like they're just not. Um, and there are some days when I, I will just leave them together for like an evening anyway, just to see, because I've been surprised before, but like most of the time when the female's ready, she going to be ready and like, he will be on it. <laughs> So you kind of just have to be patient and especially not brewmating. You're not going to have, uh, you know, necessarily an idea of when she's actually ready. You can, you know, you might see some signs of ovulation, but with corns, it's a lot harder to tell. Like ball pythons, you can tell because they get just like, like they swell up. Corns, some of them do. Some of them really don't. Like I, I have a few females that I, I don't see a difference in them until they're like ready to lay. And then it's like, you know, a couple of weeks before I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, now you look rabid. <laughs> like, good to have confirmation. Let me give you a lay box. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't it's, even try. It's, yeah. It's, it's so much harder with corns. I mean, I'll do the thing, you know, where you hold them up and see if there's like, you know, flat and then the bump and you know, some of them it's kind of obvious, but most of the time I just use that to see if they're actually rabid because that's yeah. really the only time I can tell. So. Yeah, and for me, it's like I after that first shed after brumation, that's yeah. when I start pairing. There may be no interest. There probably will be no interest at least for two to a few more weeks. Oh, yeah. And then, uh, but yeah, yeah, that's kind of when I can be safe to be like, you know, right? Yeah, and, like and if they're not like going near each other at all, mm -hmm. then I know that you know we have some more space. And then you'll get into that period where it's kind of like a gradient in which the males trying, the females not letting them. They're just yeah. Yeah, you can tell when they're just not feeling it. And the guys are like, oh, come on. But then you have like that pair that has paired before. And I found that for whatever reason, my older females, my older males, especially those that have been together before, mm -hmm. like they, everything happens earlier. Just because like yeah. they're like, it seems like they're in sync and like, yeah. oh, now it's time. Yeah, that they're especially like really experienced males and females, same pairs, like you're saying. They just, you know, they'll just lock up like, yeah, whatever, it's fine. This is what we do <laughs> here. Like, okay, yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think it's, uh, <laughs> but I think it's important to like not either not cut yourself short as far as like, oh, this isn't happening, kind of keep oh, on yeah. going. Yeah. Like I, I said, I start in, you know, January. They don't usually pair until like March. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've occasionally had mm -hmm. really locks but most of the time no but i'll start early just in case so you know i'll throw them in once a week and if i don't see anything i'll try the next week 
And I and I feel like at least from what I've seen is those early locks are usually like very forceful by the male type of locks. And yeah. then you give it like two more weeks and then it's like the females chilling and it's just happening. So it's um yeah, like kind of like I said before, is kind of a gradient of of yeah. interest between the two. And most of the time when the female is kind of giving those signs that she's not ready, you're probably not gonna get a fertile clutch from a pairing then. Um it's you really get better results when she's actually willing because you know that's just they instinctively know you know that's just how their dna is coded like they they will be ready when they're actually ready so yeah and for me i feel like it's always the side of caution for that female mm -hmm. so i yeah. feel like if the pairing's happening like i'm confident that at least she has enough size to yeah to make it happen. And if I don't breed her, she'll probably pass slugs because she is at that level. God. I have so many that will just lay anyway. <laughs> it's like, I might as well pair them. My son kissed. She gets so skinny every year, but she will, she will lay without fail every time if I don't pair her. So I just, I pair her up and then I feed her like crazy. And she's one of those, like she'll, she can handle just about anything I throw at her. So like she can eat two adult mice in a week and she's fine. <laughs> so she usually gains the weight rack really quickly, but. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to, I know a lot of Python people are like, Oh, I'm going to give them a year off or something like that for colubrids. It's like once they're kind of on the clock there, it's harder. Yeah. They don't, don't want to. <laughs> no. We'll just give you another clutch. Yeah. And it's like, and you feel bad wasting. Oh. Yeah. You don't want to waste that energy of the female. It's not that you want another clutch out of her. It's that she's going to pass the slugs anyway and look just as bad. So why not even make that a fertile clutch? But. Yeah. And also, you know, I, I've heard of more issues with egg binding from slugs than I have with fertile eggs. So, you know, just. Keep, keep their weight up, do what you can. You know, sometimes you can't help it, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's, I, um, I lost a uh, one female that was too small that decided she was going to lay anyway. So that was very, and that's one thing where it's like, what are you supposed to do? You, you kind of had to trust nature to kind of take its course. And sometimes nature is wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, Sometimes maybe even that female was never going to have the structure in which to have those eggs. Maybe, you know, there was something wrong with her oviduct in which it was smaller than usual. Or mm -hmm. yeah, There's a lot of things that can go wrong. So moral of the story, if you don't want your female to die, don't. Breed. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> Do not go into breeding unless you are prepared to lose animals because it will happen. It Whether happens. it's the adults or the babies or. If you can't handle death, do not breed. Yeah. So a little bit more about breeding eggs. Um, do you have a lay box in the enclosure for the female? Yeah. Um, I use like six quart tubs um, that I cut like a, a hole in at the top of the lid. Um, right now I'm using clear lids because it's easier for me to like kind of peek in without bothering them. Mm -hmm. Good um, idea. People prefer more of an opaque box, especially for like more nervy females. I may have to do that with one of my girls because she's terrified of people. Like she, she's the strangest thing. I thought when I first got her, I thought she was just really calm. No, she would shut down like completely and just not move. Um, I found that out when she decided that she was going to actually move and then she bit me. <laughs> um, she, she will absolutely fly out of your hands like she doesn't want anything to do with people so i may have to uh give her a little more privacy um but yeah i just do like a six quart tub um it fits right inside their racks they really like sitting on top of it because there's just enough space for them to like kind of crawl on top so it's really nice for them um and then it gives them something to like you know climb over and like you know get some more exercise um but yeah you want to you want to let them just have their box and just leave them alone you know, I peek occasionally, but I try not to mess with them too much during that that period. Um, the more stress they are, the you know more chance you have of something going wrong. So, want them yeah. to be calm and happy and well fed. And if they decide they don't want to eat, don't worry about it. They'll be okay. Just don't force it. Yeah, and that's something uh, I do the same egg box situation. I usually fill that with sphagnum moss or. 
in certain years, it may have been Coco Hus betting or depending on kind of what I'm feeling at the time. But Sphagnum holds moisture. And that Perlite? Was, uh, vermiculite. Vermiculite. It's like really light. It's messy. I don't recommend it. I just, yeah, stick to spag moss because they usually move it out of the way anyways. But I don't know. I was trying to like, I figured if they laid in the vermiculite, I could just leave it. And then I wouldn't have to mess with the eggs. Um, this last year, I I actually just separated everybody because I, I, I'd never done that before. It was interesting. I've always left the eggs in a clump. Um, I actually separated them this year uh, for the first time because I was always afraid to. Like all of them? Yeah, like I, I separated all of them like Python style. Holy OCD, Laura. I know. What is, oh, them, man. It was so <laughs> And I, I actually kind of liked it. It was nice. But um, I don't know. I, I've i heard people say that um, if you separate them, that you'll get more like aggressive, like more defensive babies. And I'm wondering if that's what's going on this year because like all of them oh, like, a few are just crazy like psychopath <laughs> um so we'll see maybe i'll separate them but like lay them together so that they're touching i don't know so if anyone listening hasn't had corn snake eggs the amount of time and attention it would take to pull a apart a clutch Especially is a clutch. so ridiculous that i can't believe you did that <laughs> meticulously just peeling them apart. And, and the whole time you're like, I hope I do not pierce this egg. If I pierce this egg, I'm pretty much screwed. Yep. So not only is it meticulous, it's also very nerve wracking. Yes, very much so. So like I only do that if the clutch is actually too tall, if she lays too many eggs on top of each other in which I can't close the egg box and then I'll kind of take off the, the top two. And I'm kind of shaking just doing that. So uh, the fact that you pull them all apart is just. I I think I just I watched so many like python breeders. Like I kept watching yeah. them eggs, and they were like they would like dimple the eggs to pull them apart. I'm like, uh, what are you doing? And it turns out that's fine. Like they're they're tougher than we give them credit for. So it really wasn't a problem pulling them apart. You know, I had a few that would not separate. I did leave those. Um, if you have to pull too hard, don't. Just don't. You know, they'll be fine together. But, like, if you want to separate them, they'll be okay. You know, just you got to do it early. Um, if you, I you was know, about to say that, yeah. Yeah, if you find a clutch that's, like, five days old plus, it's not going to happen. You know, just take that whole cluster and just set it in the egg box and leave it. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, so the, the females actually secrete something in which the eggs stick together so that the eggs don't roll over in the wild. And yeah. that's essentially why they stick together. And that kind of dries over time. So really, I think probably 24 hours, you want to get those things as soon as possible to kind of separate yeah. them like that. Yeah. But yeah. You're crazy, man. I, I want to see, <laughs> I want to see what, uh, yeah. so like I was like, well, I'll try it. Sure. Yeah, I'm curious because, like, for me, it seems kind of nuts. Send you of the eggs all separated. Yeah, yes. Yeah, it. it seems like it seems like there is no logical explanation that they may be defensive after being separated. But then again, they don't have that they don't have that barrier of their clutch mates around them, in which they may see more things even through the eggshell or something that makes them more the defensive. Thought, the thought is that. Part of the reason, and there's there's multiple reasons why um, herpetologists believe that uh, colubrid eggs adhere together in a mouse, and it, most eggs, in fact. Um, and some of that has to do with um, like hydration, um, because the you know the substrate is usually fairly damp. The eggs on top, they don't have that. So if you don't have humidity through the whole, you know, space then some of that water can pass through the eggs because the shells are partially porous. Um, that's why you want to be careful not to let water drip on them because they can expand too much and then crack. Um, so the, the idea is that, you know, maybe they help share hydration with the eggs that are on the top um, from the ones that are on the bottom that have the most access, access to moisture. So it's, it's one thought anyway. I don't think anybody really knows for sure like why they adhere together. Um, I've heard different things from, um, you know, being less likely for all of them to be preyed on 
if one is eaten um, because they don't necessarily like recognize that they're separate. You know, so it'll like eat one and it's like, oh, that's all there is. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if anybody's like had definitive evidence for that. So. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's, I don't think it's very easy to draw these kind of conclusions. Yeah. Um, they, simply serpents. Say, yeah. They might uh, feel the heartbeat as possible. I mean, they're very sensitive creatures. So especially when it comes yeah, to. Yeah. If you like, think about it, like when they talk about humans and hearing the mother's heartbeat is comforting and therefore having the clutch together, they may hear each other's heartbeat or, I mean, obviously they don't hear, they probably feel more for snakes, yeah. but yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they have ear structures. It's just their internal and their, their like range of hearing is much different. So they wouldn't hear a heartbeat. I feel. <laughs> yeah, no, they would, they would more just like feel the, like the vibration or whatever. So. But Ryan said, James, get out of here with that hippie shit. So. <laughs> oh, poor. Too, too many emotions in these snake clutches. But, um, yeah, I think it's uh, as far as incubating. What mm -hmm. do you do uh, incubation wise? So I, um, I took a, I, I just copied what Garrett Hartle uh, reach out reptiles does for his ball pythons or not ball pythons his retics why did i say ball oh man pythons? we should take that snippet yeah oh, we should it. ask garrett hartle about his ball oh pythons. god please don't do oh, that no. i'm trying to oh, no. i'm trying to get in with that crowd <laughs> 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 that's the reason i made his discord um <laughs> no uh but he he made a, a video a while back about um you know how to build an incubator out of a cooler with water in the bottom and aquarium heaters and i that's what i did um and it worked beautifully like i have never had such great success with an incubator i love it I wait so you're it. keeping pretty constant temperatures then yes um it took me a while to get the temperatures right because it was a new thermostat and just everything was new and it was little iffy um part of my problem was the aquarium fan that i used to circulate water uh it was actually raising the temperature by a few degrees and i couldn't stop it from raising it above like 84 so i took that out and then it was perfect constant you know it was, there was some mild fluctuation but it was like within you know a degree it was like 81 to 83 it was perfect so the humidity was the big thing. It was perfect humidity. I did not have to soak the substrate. You know, I, I left it pretty dry. And yeah, all the eggs were fantastic. No, nobody dried out. Um, there wasn't too much condensation. It was, it was great. I highly recommend it. Because um, then you have, you know, all the water in the basin that's just releasing water into the air constantly. Um, you get, you know, almost 100% humidity. So and what you want is relative humidity. You don't yes. want wet yes. eggs. Yes. Yeah. You don't want them soaking. Uh, you don't want, you know, soggy substrate. That's a real good way to end up with dead eggs. Um, but yeah, if you can keep the humidity high and the substrate more dry, perfect. And so yeah. uh, you may have said this in the beginning, but what was the temp? Um, I keep it usually about 82. Um, so it'll fluctuate kind of between like 81 and 83. Uh, I try not to let it go above 85 just because higher temperatures, you can get much smaller babies. Um, I, I've heard instances of like higher kink rates and things like that with, with hotter temperatures. Um, but usually like the lower you incubate, the, the larger they'll be when they emerge. It takes longer. Um, but, you know, I, I don't like teeny tiny babies, so... I try to make sure they're at least like, you know, five or six grams when they hatch out, if not bigger. Um, and I had some nine gram babies this year. Damn. Honkers. They're <laughs> just big and angry. <laughs> <laughs> I always love that. It's like I, uh, especially my Miami Oka tees, they come out and I'm like, you're a full snake. I'm so yeah. glad. The yeah. other, some of the other clutches are like, What's going on, man? Like this is, a, you could be like, you could be half the size easily. Oh yeah. No, I've, I've hatched some teeny, teeny, tiny babies. Um, my, my cayenne Amel, uh, she was 
probably less than two grams a hatch. Mm. I had to feed her a micro link and like pinky heads for her first few meals. But she caught up eventually. I mean, she she grew, but she was so tiny. So, so tiny. Yeah, and for, for me, as far as incubation goes, I've done... I've done hoco, uh, hoco, cocoa husk in the past in which I've done, uh, you know, slightly dampen it and then put kind of a shallow pool of water at the bottom and mm -hmm. that's kept relative humidity up. Um, and that did really well in Texas where the, where I kept them was 82 degrees and I kept that closet at the time I was still in the closet and it was 82 degrees at all times. Now in this bigger room that I have in the old row house that I'm in now in Philly, it's like, uh, I keep it at 82 to 84, but it fluctuates. And I'm seeing, I went from 100% hatch rate in Texas to 80 to 90 the last two years, which is not good in my opinion. So um, that's definitely something that I'm trying to wrangle in as far as, and I think it's, uh, even though I had read previously that corn snakes, a lot of people have let them experience those fluctuations. Mm-hmm. I have found that maybe not the best. Maybe I want to keep it more constant and kind of like you said, maybe even hook up a little incubator setup, uh, kind of like you were doing. Yeah, I, I think that it helps just having a thermostat attached to like a heater. Um, you know, I mean, depending on the temperatures where you're at, if it's going to be too warm, then obviously you're, there's not much you can do about that. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't know, just the consistency seems to be better because yeah, I've, I've heard the same thing where people like, you know, they'll just throw it up on a, you know, high shelf or something and leave it. And, you know, that fluctuates throughout the year and they get big, healthy babies and, you know, good hatch rates. That has not been my experience. So I've also heard it from the people who produce a lot. So maybe having those fall offs in which 90% is not as big of a deal when, when we're working with, just a few clutches, like a hundred percent matters. Maybe and most, most of the people that are producing big numbers, they usually have a room that's temperature controlled and it true. is consistent. Um, so I, I think that generally you're going to get better results just keeping the same temperature rather than letting it fluctuate day and night. Um, I don't think there's, you know, a huge benefit or I, I feel like there's maybe more of a risk doing, you know, letting it fluctuate too much. So. I, I just, I err on the side of caution and just keep it the same temperature. Yeah. And I've heard people say that fluctuations may make stronger babies mm -hmm. in which I have had zero benefit in any fluctuations. So. Yeah, not, so. yeah. Yeah. So take my experience and my woes and learn from them and do what Laura does. Uh, but as far as. Do what works for you. That's that is that is true. Do what works because you know different climates, especially, you, you're going to have different experiences. You know, this is Ohio. You're in Pennsylvania. You know, California is a whole different ball game. Uh, you know, northern states, it's going to be different. So, you know, just usually, if if you can find somebody in your area that breeds, uh, ask what they do, and and kind of just do what they do. Usually, that'll work pretty well. That makes a whole lot of sense. Absolutely. So as far as once the babies come out. Outside. <laughs> yeah, one... exactly, exactly, Ryan. <laughs> oh, yeah, Florida. <laughs> so when you get those babies out, as far as getting them started, I know I usually, I mean, everyone starts out on small pinks, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you start frozen thawed right off the, right off the rip? I do just because I don't have like a supplier for like live. And I think that I think Kyle would be too sad if I fed live. <laughs> I would be too, because they're just baby pinky mice are cute. They're really, really stinking cute. And when they get eaten alive and not constricted. That is the thing. When they go screaming down, is is a little much. It's horrifying. It's just not a pleasant way to go. And I yeah. I don't like doing that if I can avoid that. So I do start them on frozen. Um, I typically will offer boiled first um, or at the very least like washed. Um, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it seems to work really well. Um, you want to kind of wash off all the like dirt smell and like, you know, mouse urine. Usually babies, like baby mice, they're very clean. 
You know, people think of mice as being dirty, but they keep their babies real clean. <laughs> so if you uh, give them either like give them a quick wash, um, you can use Dawn. Um, I've used like the palm olive, like natural stuff. Um, some people use like Windex. Um, I've also used chlorhexidine, which is fantastic. Um, and it smells nice. Um, at least to me it does. I don't know. I like the smell of chlorhexidine. Um, it usually will get them, you know, more interested in it right away. Um, and then you can kind of, you know, try them on like unscented and stuff like that. So I'll, I'll give them like one meal where they're, they're scented and then I, I might wash them off with just water and then go from there. So, so that's a consideration that I've never exactly thought about before in the way of, um, when, when you do gas mice, whether it's pinkies, adults, whatever, they usually go to the bathroom when they do so, when they die. Yep. And the, the smell of a mouse freshly out of the mother is probably a lot different than the smell of the mouse after they're gassed and they all kind of go to the bathroom all over each other. Yep. So that makes a lot of sense. And I've also heard, um, I know Stu Tennyson does baking soda to, to clean them off. I, I personally use usually dish soap. Yeah, um, I do dish soap. It's easy. You know, just a tiny bit. You know, you got to make sure you rinse them real well. But, like, you really got to wash them. Like, you can't just, like, let them sit for half a second in soapy water. You got to, like, get, get your hands in there and, like, clean them off. Yeah. I, um, that's, at least that's – I've had the best luck with doing that. So. Yeah. Basically until the, the suds go away and then I feel okay with that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely make sure those suds are gone because that <laughs> yeah. will make havoc on their digestive system. If you've ever accidentally eaten soap, it's not pleasant. It kills all of the bacteria in your gut. And yeah, that's bad. You mean when Real you're bad. when you said a curse word when you were 10? I didn't. Uh, I was a good girl. Uh, once I said piss, my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> But I never, I don't think I ever had to eat soap. Um, I, I think I did. I think I did. I'm going to be honest. Sorry, mom. I'm telling this. So. I, was, I was very sheltered. So like I didn't learn <laughs> until like high school. And then it was like, I could never say them because I just, it was too funny and like embarrassing at the same time. I don't know. I was, and now I swear like a sailor and my mom was embarrassed with me. I remember the first time I accidentally Kids said these days. in front of her and oh God, uh, I was mortified. So <laughs> if if you're watching this somehow, if you found this, I'm sorry. <laughs> I swear, I swear a lot. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess that's the thing. It's like you got to that point where you're like, you said it and then you like punished yourself. You're like, oh. yeah. I just stopped caring. And I'm so happy <laughs> you stopped caring. So yeah, yeah. it's fine. Do you know what kids say when they're playing video games these days? I mean, there's, mm -hmm. it, it's pretty bad. Oh, so yeah. uh, that's where I got it. So, yeah, <laughs> playing World of Warcraft. There you go. Yeah. So um, once you're getting these um, these babies going, you so you're washing them off or you're boiled. Um, when do you transition from say that first boiled to offering them frozen thawed straight up? Um, usually within one or two feedings. Um, sometimes I'll, like I said, I'll, I'll wash them just with water just to get kind of the initial grime and it's sort of like a slow transition. Um, sometimes I just rinse them in water because they're gross. Like they get, <laughs> they get a little, you know, a little bloody, a little the hemoglobin stuff like leaking out. We survived Byron's chat. Yes. Yes, we did. I don't know what that means. It's okay. Don't worry about it. You, you, if you know what it is, you've, been playing the game way too long wait way too long um just just don't worry about it anyway um but yeah so i'll, I'll wash them with water and i like i said I, I will still do that sometimes just because they just are gross and i just want them to be cleaner so i'll just kind of give them a quick you know a little rinse and just pat them dry um and i i usually offer either on like a little square of paper towel so like i'll take a paper towel and i'll just like rip it into like little squares um and I'll have like a stack of them just sitting on the baby rack and just grab one pinky, grab one pinky. Um, but uh, I also use like, I, I hate doing it because I hate using plastic, but those little plastic belly cups for like water bowls, they're really good for feeding too. Um, they're usually for like, you mean like condiment cups? At yeah, least that's the size of it. Yeah. yeah, like little ketchup cups. I use those for water bowls for the babies. Um, 
And like, yeah, me want- too. I was just clarifying that for like normal humans. Yeah, yeah, where it's not normal. <laughs> uh, yeah. You can get them from like, you know, webstaurant.com or whatever. Like I get like a huge case of just like these little, little like two ounce cups. Um, or like, I think, I think I'm using one and a half ounce, but they, they're perfect. Cause like they fit, you know, in my racks, which are very short. Um, but you can put the pinky in there and then they can like grab it. And it's, it's almost like they're having to find like a burrow. So like, you know, maybe it gives them some enrichment. Maybe, I don't know, but it's really clean because it keeps all the bedding off of them. I mean, they'll still drag it into the bedding because, you know, they're dumb, but babies are dumb. Really, really dumb. That goes across the board. So um, are you using, and I should have said this in the beginning, are you using Aspen, like shredded Aspen or Sandy Chip, or what are you using for those babies? I usually use Santa Chip. Um, prices have gone like absolutely through the roof. Like they're astronomically expensive right now. Um, I have some Zoomed Aspen that I just swore today I would never buy again because it's so dusty, like so, so dusty. You get so much of it, but uh, I hate it. So right now I have them on paper towels because I just got sick of dealing with bedding. But um, yeah, you can use pretty much whatever you want. They'll be fine. They're they're corn snakes. They'll they'll deal. Um, yeah. Just want to make sure that they don't get too humid. Um, if you keep them too wet, like you can get like scale rot and like respiratory infections and things like that. So and mold. Like I have I have to keep on top of. Oh, them. so quick, yeah. Yeah, and they always dump their water bowls. I'm trying to find a solution. Oh, I super glue them, or or I hot glue them. So I put hot glue mm. on the bottom and then I glue them to the Tupperware. I I did that with some tubs. And I hated it because I could never get them cleaning. cleaning. I know, I know. It's a double-edged sword. I know. So, I fixed one thing and another yeah. thing's a little bit broken. So I, well, I'm trying to come up with a solution <laughs> to that. And I'll let you know if I ever actually do. But um, I'm looking into like 3D, 3D printing like a holder that they can't tip. I'm, I'm, I'm one step ahead of you. Well, no, no. We're, we? we're, we're on the same page. Okay. But um, it's a different method of doing that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. But we're on oh, to yeah. something. <laughs> trade some ideas. Um, yeah. I have some drawings I can show you. So, um, but yeah, I was going to have a, a friend like help 3d print. Like some I, I have a guy, I have yeah. a guy, he listens to the podcast. He keeps corn snakes. He knows things. He 3d prints stuff for me. So like the gecko ledges and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so he has, he has printed out those gecko ledges and we're going to be working on these water bowls and yeah. Okay. So let's, okay. let's do something. All right. Yeah, absolutely. I'm totally on board. In a plumbing ring. Yeah, you could put them in a plumbing ring. The problem is I would have to cut them down because the racks that I use are very, very short. Um, they're like about the size of the six quart tub, but they're like this tall, like literally. They're teeny tiny. Um, so I had some ideas on how to maybe make that work. So, but yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, but yeah, uh, definitely want to keep on top of things like mold um, and just like excess water just sitting so and yeah it's a problem with paper towel because as soon as they dump their water bowl it's just the whole thing is just wet That's yeah and if you if you keep in like i keep in tupperwares i'm assuming you keep in something similar yeah um i'm using the the i10 rack um that's on reptile basics um i've got two of them just like stacked on top of each other um you can fit 60 of the the big tubs or like 120 of the little like pencil box but i hate the pencil box ones just because they always tip their water and it's always a mess um but if if we can fix that i might go back to using those because they're really good temporarily and i can put a lot of babies in that rack Mm -hmm. yeah just no matter what you're kind of confined to a small space and anything that happens in that space tends to get out of control very quickly um especially they would like try to go past the water bowl and they'd push it and so it would just tilt and so water would just go everywhere it was a mess yeah and that's not something where like you can i wouldn't hot glue something to a permanent tub for me it's easy to hot glue it to a tupperware because oh. like yeah, yeah those either. things run away yeah yeah exactly <laughs> i've been over just thinking i get some new ones yeah they're cheap to replace now these they're not very expensive but i i wouldn't want to do that so and for me i prefer usually aspen uh chips or aspen shreds basically because i allow the animals to kind of burrow in them and do their thing 
where that makes it hard for the keeper is that they can go to the bathroom on Sandy Chip. They stay on top of it and they go to the bathroom usually in a corner or something like that. In the mm -hmm. shredded Aspen, they can burrow everywhere so they can go to the bathroom everywhere. So you can have a pinky hidden anywhere. So like, mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest things when you have baby corn snakes is that pinky that doesn't get eaten the night before. And then you give yeah. it a couple days and then it smells like the black plague in your room. And then you're going through a hundred corn snakes looking for a, a dead pinky. You have to dig it out. Yeah. Uh, the stuff that you use, at least the stuff that you sell. Um, I really liked that. I actually might, might get some more of that. So especially if you start selling bales of them. Okay. Like so them. I'll try to, yeah, I'll try to figure out a way. The only thing is that like shipping's hard. Yeah, yeah, that tends to be the the hard thing about any kind of like, you know. Because like to get you a reasonable amount of it, it needs to be rather big for people like us who need something bigger. But then you need to be able to ship it for a reason. I don't know. It's very, it's hard. It's hard to do with substrate, essentially. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we'll talk about. I can that. figure it out. Yeah. But um, yeah, so that's what I do with substrate, all that stuff. We talked about water. Um, I usually give like half a paper towel roll for a hide. I'm not sure if that's hundred percent. I mean, obviously it's not necessary, but I'm sure most yeah, keepers don't. I, I think it's, I think it's useful. Um, I, I do find that they use hides when you give them to them. Um, one thing that I kind of experimented with, um, in the last year or so was, um, I have these little tiny, um, they're also from, I think reptile basics, those little black, black plastic hides that come in like different sizes. You can get them like up to like this, like big huge box um things with just like the little you know the little mouse hole kind of cut out um i have some itty bitty teeny tiny ones that i use for my hatchlings and what i was doing when they first hatched is i'd put them on santa chip because i had it still um and i would flip the hide upside down and put like a wet paper towel in there and that way they had like a place to go where they wanted you know if they wanted that extra moisture and they could still be dry if they wanted to and it helped keep the humidity up it helped with sheds i didn't have any stuck sheds um so like that's something to consider is upside down hides um you can also put food in upside down hides and it's a little easier to like feed them um because they don't make a mess they don't drag it down to their substrate they actually go into the hide and eat there um so if you're worried about babies you know maybe becoming impacted try that you know yeah, so I have done the same thing, except I just put another condiment cup in there. So it's That's and I can put the pinky, but I mean, they usually knock that over or um, I've done the condiment it. cup and filled it with sphagnum, um, oh, yeah. especially for this kind of tricky baby in which um, I could see he was kind of stuck shed. He was kind of tiny. So I was just kind of super freaked out about him. But I did that this year. I ended up feeding him a bunch of times. And then he just died randomly. Like, yeah. One of my holdbacks passed on me, and I'm like, oh. of course it was the best one in the clutch. Oh, it always is. Always, always males. I have such <laughs> bad luck with males. I've started holding back twice the males I need. Really? Because I just, I, I don't know what it is. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, really, one of, some of the worst stuff is when, you know, you get a baby past that stage in which you're worried about it. Mm hmm and then like it's a year old it's two years old it's just something you just never know what's going on in that animal's genetics or things that could happen externally or yeah it's a super bummer so when you get that when you get those animals started how well let's talk about kind of the ways to get them started so if it doesn't take that boiled pinky oh uh, let me bring up the list uh nancy levate yeah, Levay. Every time I say your name, it sounds weird to me, but yeah. Um, Snicker Snakes, you know her. She's in some of the corn groups. She's on like the forums. Um, she has a massive list of things to try. And even in like the correct order. Um, I don't have that handy, but I can get it. So if you want it, just like email me, contact at windserpents.com. Uh, and I will give you that list. Um but she, she has like everything from, you know, scenting with Dawn to chicken juice, you know, trying anoles, frogs, um, you know, baby food, things like that. Um, washing with Windex. Um, Chlorhexidine is not on that list. So you can add that to the list if you want. Um, or any other like, you know, kind of cleaner like that. That's like people use Chlorhexidine. Relatively safe. 
so it's like it's you, you're really not supposed to ingest it but like you know you, you want to wash it really good like you would with soap right uh, just you know rinse it off real good um but uh and, and people use chlorhexidine like in mouths like for like some farm animals like to help kind of clean out wounds and, and like sores and stuff like that so it's relatively safe just be careful you know um but yeah things like going for a car ride um you can try shipping it to a friend um or just like driving it across town usually is kind of roughly similar um you just put it in a box and take a little drive um i've tried that before i have not had that work um but i have i have shipped a, a non-feeder and had it immediately start eating so you know sometimes things work yeah yeah, I've uh, as far as my kind of hierarchy of getting things feeding, I usually do, I usually do frozen thawed pinky right off the bat. Mm -hmm. If they don't take frozen thawed pinky, I'll go to live, and that's not the first time. Listen, I probably do it two to three times. Sure. Um, if it doesn't take a frozen thawed pinky, then I'll go live, and then after live, I will do pinky with the head split, and then I will do boiled pinky. And then I will do pinky wash with Dawn dish soap and then scented with lizard. Mm -hmm. And then after that, if I'm feeling real frisky, I'll go totally a null. Mm -hmm. um, recently, I kind of have too many animals to go totally a null with everyone. Yeah. Um, but I, if I, I had a reasonable amount, that's what I would do. Yeah. I'm really hesitant to use the nulls just because um, I actually wound up with the lizard strain of crypto. Oh. So yeah, be careful about that. All right, so fuck that. So what I uh, an old juice you can get like an old juice from Repelinx. Um, they have they have an old, they have uh, gecko, frog, fish. Um, I've got a whole set in my freezer. It stuff works great. So that way you don't have to worry about any weird diseases that can pass to your animals. So be very yeah, if you're kind of thing. If you're a psychopath and you want a gut and a null, this is what I do as far as the null juice goes. Um, so I, I usually get like an annul from, say, big box store or something like that. And I. That's where that annul came from, by the way, was a big box store. It was a show. Oh, yeah, of course. But I'll, I'll share with you the process in which. Go ahead. Yeah. So it was frozen and euthanized and then gutted. And then I put one annul, one gutted annul to about four ounces of water and I boil the water. So I'll boil the water typically for maybe about a half hour and then I'll put it on simmer and then I'll simmer that for probably four to six hours or so, depending on how everything looks. And I'll stir it occasionally, 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 and then that will be your annul juice. Um, and hopefully that kills crypto. Hopefully boiling would kill, you would hope. The thing about crypto is the oocysts, oocysts, like o o c y s t. Um, they're really hardy, and that's really? such a danger because it's really hard to kill. Um, very high concentration of peroxide will do it though. So yeah. Also, long-term UV exposure, but that takes like six months. So. Oh, so that's really long-term. <laughs> So if, if any of our folks who are really up and up on how crypto works, could you tell me if boiling would kill it? Yeah, I'm not. That really, would be neat. I don't think it would, but it might. I don't know. It's probably sufficient. I don't know. We'll find out. I, yeah, I'm always interested in learning that stuff, obviously, for the well-being of my animals as well as anyone else who I'm telling to do that. So. Yeah, I don't think that's a very common problem, but I mean, like. I'm sure it's. Yeah. yeah. It's in captivity. If there's anything in which can happen, it's best to avoid it if we can. I mean, we can obviously avoid it. Avoid it. They said I got quiet, so I leaned forward. Our <laughs> has like, you know, like I can get really up on it. Oh damn! So I think I think it's just I was talking at the same time you're talking, and you got lower. I don't know. Maybe. Uh. But as far as we've gotten the baby started, all that good stuff, mm -hmm. um, how long do you wait until you sell? Um, usually I like to get at least, you know, like four or five meals. I, I haven't really like 
I, I kind of just sort of fudge it a little bit, but like they, they have at least four or five meals before they leave. Um, you know, if somebody asks me about something that hasn't had that many meals, I'll probably just tell them, you know, you can buy it now, but wait a little bit. Just let me make sure. Um, but I haven't had any issues really. Usually once they've had like three or four, they're, they're pretty solid. You know, if, if they're going to stop eating, they're going to do it anytime, you know, so. So there's all a bunch of things coming up on the chat here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ammonia and then peroxide just to nuke. Yeah, that's that's essentially what uh what I did with some things. But yeah, for the most part, it's just if you think it's been infected, throw it away. And then autofab welding said, "Oh, sis, because I'm gonna say it like that because there's two O's are yep. killed at over 169 degrees Fahrenheit yep. or 160." Um, that might not be a universal number for all because. Like I said, crypto is especially hardy, and there are multiple different species of crypto. So I'm talking about Serpentis and um, uh, Varanum, I think is what they called it now. It used to be uh, Philo something. I don't remember. Scientific names. I know too many, and they're all getting mixed up in my head now. Now I'm Googling myself here. Oh, don't Google yourself on camera. <laughs> it's never a good idea. Oh, boy. Can it build tolerance to heat? Oh, this is, a, this is a big rabbit hole. Oh, no. I didn't know. I spent some time looking at, like, studies and, like, cleaners and things. There were there were some cleaners that, that showed to be really effective against the, um, um, like, the strains that you find in cattle. Um, I think it's parvum. Um, but they were only available in... Europe because they're banned here, which might tell you they something. They probably give us cancer. Yeah. Like, I don't know about cancer, but like, I mean, higher percentages of peroxide, I mean, it's it's a pesticide. It can do some really nasty things to the water. So, yeah. Yeah, probably not the best. Yeah. Be, be cautious with hydrogen peroxide because... You might be breaking the law if you use too high a percentage and you just dump really? it. Really? Yes. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, it's technically a class as a pesticide, so it, it needs to be disposed of properly. Um, so, like, I mean, if you're using it in a spray bottle, you know, whatever. But, like, if you're using large quantities of it, you need to dispose of it properly. So, take it to a plant for processing. So, that's I interesting. Don't, I don't know where that would be in this area. So, I've just used it in a spray bottle. Right. <laughs> So getting baby started, what else we got? Uh, letting them go. As far as how do you typically, what's your typical process in which selling a snake to someone goes? Uh, is there any type of qualifying process? Um, there hasn't really been, and I, I probably should be. Hello, kitty. Oscar's getting bored. Um, actually, no, he's getting hungry. Uh I, I probably should ask more questions of people, but usually I'm just like, you know, are you 18 plus? Like, have you read my terms and service, you know, like my, my terms and, and shipping info and all that. Um, and if they haven't, I'll link it and, you know, go over it with them. Um, but I mean, I'll, you know, I'll ask a little bit about caging and temperature and things like that. And I, I haven't sold very many this year, so I haven't really had many conversations. Um, but it's because I have it posted on Morph Market because I'm petrified of the issues that FedEx has been having. Like I already had one major delay and I, it was scary. I packed. Yeah. It's been it. tricky. It got there just fine, but I, that was nerve wracking. So, cause it was like in the middle of nowhere outside of San Francisco, got there at like eight o'clock at night. <laughs> like yeah. after it was supposed to get there. So but uh, I use uh, I use reptiles to you, to you. Um, so Debbie is really good about being on that. I'm sorry, my camera is shaking. Because... <laughs> Oscar is Oscar. wanting some screen time. Over. Come here. Yeah, it's been it's been definitely a little bit interesting shipping, but I'm kind of the same way as as you as far as um, 
I think sometimes when you get emails from people, you can tell when someone knows absolutely nothing and you know kind of when to pry a little bit more and you know. For most people I ask like, hey, is this your first reptile or is this your first corn snake? Yeah. And I kind of gauge off of that and then say, you know, I kind of kind of prod a little bit. I noticed that a lot of people are very quick to give that information too. Like where, when it is their yes. first, they're excited. You know, they're asking all the questions and like they can't wait and you know, or at least, you know, if it's one of their first. Um, and they're usually like very open to learning at that stage too, if they're excited about it. Those are my favorites. So, you know, I get chatty with my customers. Um, but yeah, I've, I've had the, you know, what's the lowest you'll go on this that I haven't replied to one of those. I don't think I'm going to. I just, I feel like I should, like, I feel like it's good customer service to just say something, but like at the same time, I don't, really want to justify it with a response i do kind of one of those kind of passive aggressive slams in which i'm like you know um i spend a lot of time basically breeding and keeping these animals the price i set it at is the price that i set it at like this is what i think it's worth and right. i have good quality animals if you want to buy it for this price sure you know <laughs> You know, I'm I'm open to negotiating on higher priced animals, but like when it's the cheapest snake I have, and you right a lower like, and it's always the cheapest snake you have. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, ain't happening. Um, yeah, my I mean my prices are probably a little high right now, but like corn snake prices in general are up across the board. So yeah, I don't feel too bad about it. Um, yeah, because like eventually someone will come around in which like I get the random person in which it may even be their first snake, but they're willing to basically pay anything for this animal because they want either this particular animal or they want a corn snake in general. And it's like that's the person that you want in which it's not like I'm overcharging them, but I'm like, oh, like this one just happens to be three hundred dollars. And they're like, oh, that's fine because I want that snake. I, I mean, I eat a lot of costs too. You know, I'm not really taking into account how much I'm spending on bedding and feeding and, you know, my shipping boxes, I don't include that price in, in right. the animal or in the shipping cost. It's just whatever the label costs, that's what you pay. And that's, that's it. So like, you know, I'm not really making money on, on normals at all. You know, you could, if you, if you don't sell them, you know, bulk or whatever, like, right. Right. Now, yeah, you can make money on cheap animals, but selling them individually, I'm probably losing. So don't. I think if people knew <laughs> how much, because like I think I actually did the numbers for the first time this year. If people knew how much I make on animals in comparison to like other things that make a lot more sense. Like it is a very low, like percentage in which I put in to get out, put out. Yeah, um, at least for for you know retail corn snakes. I mean, some things. You know, depending on you know, the project and how well you market, things like that, you, you can make, you know, you're not going to get rich, but you can make a living. Um, you know, there's plenty of people that do it. Yeah. It's, you have to be smart. So, and most of those people are wholesaling on the side and that's really how they're making a living. So, you know, I, it's something I've thought about and something I, I kind of want to do, but I want to do it right. You know, I don't want to just have them in plain boxes. I want to have like, you know, big setup for like just a big group of like amel corns just to all like live together in like a tiny little forest. So <laughs> like that, you know. I think yeah, I think it's a way of doing wholesale. But then yeah, it's a it, um, it's a very hard it's a very hard thing to juggle when you're kind of in the middle of uh being a professional breeder in the wholesale level and keeping things very plainly or someone who has a medium size, a small collection and you want to kind of curate everything, but curating everything and having everything to that next level of keeping is what keeps you kind of from being that big time breeder or putting in a, you know, maybe it takes more time and more money and a lot of time. It's a lot of overhead. Yeah. You, know, you start adding hides. That's more cleaning. You start adding branches and plants. That's, more cleaning because you know they're gonna poop on it so <laughs> they'll poop on anything and everything like that's how it is with the geckos like I, I feel like i spend more time cleaning my geckos than i do all of my snakes because they have like little plants 
and they poop on them. So then I have to take them out and soak them and like wash them really well and then rinse them off and then make sure, you know, they don't have any soap on them or anything. Oh, it's, it's 11 tiny geckos are more work than <laughs> But they're so stinking cute. They are I love amazing. Them. I won't. I think it's a very, um, as far as like geckos go, I feel as though people are always see those as the beginners, the the crested geckos and the gargoyle geckos. And why are we suckers for like, you know, corn snakes? The easy stuff. Yeah. Um, there's a reason it's popular. You know? Yeah. And I mean, the fact that they're easy to keep just means we can have more. So. <laughs> it's a quantity quality thing i guess i don't know that's that's my theory anyway that's very true i wasn't supposed to go into geckos before we went into as far as future of corn snake breeding uh hmm. i don't know i'm not I'm not good at reading markets so i have no idea <laughs> yeah for for the most part what i was thinking is like morphs and different things that are going on so I mean, there hasn't really been much hot since the palmetto, which I feel was, you yeah. know, six years ago or so or seven years ago. Yeah. I mean, like there's there's like new combos all the time, but like there hasn't really been a lot recently. Like I don't remember seeing very many like world first, you know, I, every now and then people will post, oh, world first combo. And it's usually like palmetto because nobody's put palmetto into anything yet. Um, well, maybe they have now, but, you know, they hadn't as much um i don't know like you know what the next like big thing is going to be i don't know if people are going to go back to wanting blizzards and stuff or if it's going to be something else i'm kind of hoping that diamonds will take off um once they become more what is that that is oh uh, yeah golden golden child no just golden uh, golden corns yeah i worked with that project and I, I gave it up because it was too much of a hassle um I got those from from Joe Pierce. He's a somewhat infamous in the hobby. He's a, oh, in a bad way, good way. Huh? He's a, <laughs> depends on who you talk to. I think you just gave me my answer. It really depends on who you talk to. I mean, like he, he's always a nice guy to me, so you know, I I I'd, I'd buy from him again, sure. Um, I got a lot of missexed corns from him though. Just just a few. Um, but, uh, yeah, the golden corns are interesting, but at the same time, it's like, it's just another mm -hmm. caramel, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Is he the Joe Exotic of reptiles? No, I think that, mm, there's a few people that could be that. Yeah. Yeah. At least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what is triangle? I, I was trying to Google a picture and I couldn't even find anything. Diamond, you mean? Oh, di then maybe that's why. Because I, I just changed the shape. <laughs> that's funny. Um, uh, so diamond is um, charcoal and lava. Um, that has been remarkably difficult to produce. Um, and nobody was really quite sure why. Until, uh, I believe it was Dustin Smith. He used to be in corn snakes. Now he's in Georgia, so he can't have corn snakes. Um, yeah, there you go. There's a diamond diffuse, and that's what I have. Dude, I have that's one. fucking sick. You have that? I have one, yeah. I have a baby. Um, he's on my Show Instagram. off. Uh, you can see if you can find him on my Instagram. It should be one of the most recent photos. Um, but it it is so hard to produce, and we think that it's because um, the two genes may reside very close on the genome, so they kind of stick together. And I'd have to, like, write out a Punnett square to show you why that like why it makes it so difficult but essentially you need a recombination event where the genes get split up um for them to be produced yeah that's my my little boy he was very expensive <laughs> Canada how much Laura I'm not gonna say <laughs> <laughs> more than him so yeah. But I, what was that? I missed that. I talked over it. I'm sorry. Shipping, shipping was more expensive just because shipping from Canada is, is insane. Uh, oh, I was so he was forty five dollars. That's how much he was. Yeah, no, he was he was a lot more than that. Um. Oh, so so you imported it from Canada? Yeah, yeah. It's the only place I've found them. Um. 
he got lucky he got like three in a clutch and i immediately messaged him was like hey if you're looking to get rid of any of those please let me know um i had to split that project three ways uh so i have two others who co-own him mm. um that's a scary thing well let me tell you <laughs> <laughs> and you're the one keeping this animal keeping yes and he's tiny he's undersized i'm trying to get his him up to weight so he will breed hopefully in the next year or two oh um, that's scary man especially with my luck with males so you got it he's doing good he's he's a little sass but he's finally putting some he's growing like lengthwise so like he looks really skinny but he's like super long so i'm hoping he's gonna start to fill out more um they go through that weird like lanky stage you know it's weird like especially like when he was on like double pinks like he just he got long and like, i was afraid to move him to fuzzies because he was just so skinny and like long but yeah, he's fine um but anyway uh the two genes basically they they seem to kind of stick together so it's really really hard to make one but once you do it's really easy to make more so mm -hmm. i'm hoping that you know we'll be able to get those into the hands of more people um you know producing heads most of those babies obviously are already spoken for because they're going to go to his co-owners co um basically to purchase him fully uh and then you know the rest will be probably mine well we'll have to see if if we fight over him at all so <laughs> diamond to diamond though we'll still produce all diamonds yeah you'll get all diamonds but uh okay. uh basically het diamond to het diamond you'll get about half roughly instead of the one quarter um they seem to kind of act like one gene essentially so hmm. so they're like a lelic not a lelic mm -hmm. yeah so it's 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 weird all right, Travis, you got to explain this one to me. So Travis Wyman, who's our geneticist, he will uh, he'll message me in a week or so and he'll explain all of this to me right. and I'll I send you it. Quarter, or I said a, a half, not a quarter, but it, it would be a quarter of them would be visual because head to head. Um, so like, you know, breeding head, email to head email, you get a quarter visual and like half of them would be head and then one quarter would be not head. So that's the same, same kind of idea, except it would be two genes together and... Yeah, we don't really have many examples of that occurring, but I feel like there there's little nuances in corn snakes in which people haven't completely unfolded the genetics behind, but are yet so common. In cinder, it seems to be on the the sex chromosome. So yeah, same idea. Same idea with one, uh, banana ball pythons. Um, they are you know sex linked. Right. Um, ball pythons they actually discovered are not um, the same chromosomal configuration that most reptiles are um, really U and ZZ um, and occasionally WW because weird things happen. Um, they are XY and XX. So that's why um, the males are sex determinant. That's why the, the males can, you know, only make more males. So hmm. that is fascinating. <laughs> that's why females are more valuable because they can produce females and males generally so your your future in corn snake breeding i mean diamond is really your next your next venture yeah uh it's definitely one of them um i want to put it in sunkist it's been done already like somebody already made a, a diamond sunkist in europe but we just we don't have them in the states and somehow the ones that have been produced in europe have just never done well so you know, I mean, it's it's not going to be like, you know, world first territory, but it'll definitely be unusual and uncommon. Um, so I'm hoping to, you know, to get those out and have them you know, more available because I think they look really cool. Like, you know, like you said, they're really they're beautiful. Um, it's definitely one of my favorite like ghost complex snakes. So, I mean, this is obviously a terrible representation because this is a baby. Yeah, I've seen better pictures. Um, there were some nice ones but yeah i feel like this as an adult would look completely different than this lots of yellowing probably even with charcoal um sunkiss just kind of makes yellows pop but uh i have some sunkiss projects that i'm very very excited about i think that will make really cool babies that um i'm basically trying to kind of recreate the tequila sunkiss line stuff but with known genetics so that kind of look um, but with Sunkist and Tessera and Stripe, all kinds of fun stuff. So 
Awesome. Awesome. As for me, what I'm trying to do in the future of corn snakes is I have the honey buff project, Mm -hmm. which I just want to add yellow to yellow and try to make things that are yellow. Um, Other than that, I have coral ghost palmetto stuff, hats, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, And those have a shit ton of hats. That's uh, the fruit salad, as you said, I think. (laughs) And uh, and then I have a dark annery project, which I'm pretty psyched about. But that's really the bulk of uh, of what I'm getting down to. Honestly, I've been selling off a lot of a lot of corn snakes just to get to a point where it's like I want to be on your level in which you're paying much attention to few snakes instead of paying a lot of attention to a lot of snakes. Yeah. Uh, so. I- and see, I keep going back and forth because I'm like, on one hand, I want to keep a small collection. And then on the other hand, I want like 50 more. So, <laughs> you know. And then you're talking about retics and then you're talking about geckos. Oh, and more. Oh, I love my tigers. It's wonderful. And that's retic? Yeah, she's a she's a 50% Kalatoa. Uh, she's a tiger, Posset Snow. Um, and I'm hoping to get more like snow stuff, snow females. Um I would really like to work with snows, uh, especially in such a tiny package. Oh, they're wonderful. You could get snow corn snakes. Yeah, but those teeth so small. Oh, so you want small, just not that small. I want small, but not that small. Python small. Yeah, python. But not a ball python. No. It's a little bit more fun. Yeah. It's, personality-wise, it's just not quite there. I mean, like, you know, mine is, he's nice. You know, he'll sit there and hang out and... Yeah, I, I probably do need your 50% Kalatoa, 25% Madu. That, that sounds fantastic, but I have no money, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it to me. I will pay you back someday, but. <laughs> oh, Trade corn snakes. I, you want some corn snakes? You want some uh, geckos? I got lots. There you go. Yeah, but is it, um, I mean, since we last talked to you even, I believe it was the beginning of quarantine and you kind of, you said you were going to get into into yeah. dwarfs and yeah. here you are. Yeah, I finally got one. Uh, it was the only one I could get, but it was, you know, we got the stimulus check and I was like, <laughs> I guess I'm going to buy one. So Hell yeah. I bought her. She's fantastic. So do you plan on getting, uh, in the future, are you looking at a bunch more retakes? Is that really what you're... I really want more, Um, you know, even, even just like financially, it just seems more viable just because Mm -hmm. those can kind of pay for stuff, especially like snows. I mean, they've held their value incredibly well. Um, And, you know, being able to only produce, you know, a a handful and focus on a smaller number of those. And then I can just do whatever I want with the corn snakes and it doesn't matter if I sell them, you know, for whatever price they can go cheap and it doesn't matter. Um, you know, I don't have to worry as much about pricing with them. Um, I don't know. I just, I would rather focus on like making money with a smaller number of animals so that I can do more with the other ones. You know, I can have more hobby pets and like, you know, my Solomon Island tree boa I can have more snakes like that where it's just like it's just something cool that I just own and it doesn't make money it just sits there and looks pretty and I feed it you know it it sucks up money so so where do the geckos lie in that well I just I really wanted a leggy pet (laughs) and it seemed like a better idea to just get a bunch and see if I got you know some really nice ones from like high-end wholesale so I bought from uh, uh, ACR so Anthony Caponetto he has very nice geckos and he's got a huge collection. So, um, you know, I just, I got a wholesale group and, you know, they're, they were itty bitty, teeny tiny. It's probably smaller than most people would recommend like starting like as your first gecko. But it was a wholesale group. I've taken mm-hmm. care of geckos before. I mean, like baby yeah. these are not difficult and I have, you know, breeders and stuff that I can get advice from. I'll get another one, another student this. I might honestly, I, I've got some debts I need to pay off. <laughs> I really want another one. Like I really, really do. Um, but yeah. So yeah, so I, I got a bunch. I'm probably gonna sell most of them. Um, like I said, half of them are technically owned by another person. Um, so we'll just kind of split the profits on that on whatever we decide to sell. Um, she's gonna keep one because her kids really, really want one, but she wants to wait until it's bigger because they're younger. So she was like, just you know, 
either sell me a baby or like, you know, send me a baby or, or send me one when they're older and bigger. So she may end up getting the, the one that's tailless. Maybe we'll see. I'll, we'll see which one she wants. So, um, but yeah, it was just kind of one of those, like, you know, she, she basically helped me invest in them. Um, and then she'll get some money back at some point. So, and they, they seem decent. I mean, they're not like, you know, thousand dollar geckos or anything but i mean they're at least you know probably gonna be worth a couple hundred bucks so i paid like 60 each which isn't bad any any t- particular projects that catch your interest in crested i would like to breed a small group like really small um i've got a few that are very dark um that have like just bright pinstripes um i really like the the dark bodied like the empty back where it's just like the whole gecko is just like dark brown or black with those bright white pinstripes. Something about that look is just awesome. I think it's super hot. And I don't think it's really popular. Usually people like really reduced patterns, but I know there's people that like them. I know there's people that would want stuff like that. So it's it's probably a little niche. It's not something you would want to like produce, you know, thousands of, but uh, I, I think it's good enough that I think, I think some people would want to buy them. So I'm probably going to keep some of the darker ones and just, you know, make some decisions as I figure out which ones are male and female. I've got a couple that I'm pretty sure are male um, and the rest I'm still a little unsure of, but they're not even like five grams yet. So they're, oh, they're damn. Big, you're early. Tiny. Yeah. They're, they're, I mean, these were like two gram babies at best when they got here. So yeah. Uh, most of them have doubled in size. Yeah. It's uh, and as far as like you got the, uh... The palladarium and stuff like that. So, what are you planning on doing with that in the future? That's going to be for the the tree boa. Um, I need to. I actually just fixed the filter. Um, I have that running again. My snail is quite happy. He's <laughs> his name's Gary, right? Doesn't uh, it have to be Gary? One that I I kept is Mary because I had a tiny one, like <laughs> Mary, and that one did eventually pass. But this one is like ancient for a freshwater neurite snail. Like I don't. I don't know how old it actually is, but I've had it for at least two years and I mean, he's still trucking along all the rest have passed. Um, I had some guppies, they passed, uh, most of them from old age. And then I, I introduced some new ones and the whole thing just crashed. Um, yeah, that was not a smart idea. Um, but, uh, I've got the filter running again. I need to fill one side with some kind of like I need some like branches and stuff so she can sit above the water because it looks really bare and empty, but otherwise it's ready to go. Um, she came in with mites and I still have not fully gotten rid of them. I keep finding some. I'm just like, ah. I don't want to use the hot shot strips because I'm paranoid about it killing off my my cleanup crew, but I think I might have to do that. And Oh, so you have a bioactive tub of some sort yeah. or? That's bioactive. That that paludarium is is full. Oh, of so you have her in the paludarium right now? No, I have her in a, I have her in a quarantine tank. But like, I'm afraid that even just having it in the apartment, in close proximity, will cause problems. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Stories about like you know, cleanup crews in the next room dying because somebody used hot shot. Oh my goodness, kitty, you need to calm down. Yeah, I mean, I would scrap that whole enclosure and just go her sterile for a certain amount of time and yeah. soak her all the time and then do. I've been using NYX. Um, it seemed to work for a little bit. And I, I think I just wasn't using enough, like often enough. But I was afraid she'd ingest it. And like, you know, being an old world boa, I don't know how she handles that. I mean, she's not a corn snake. So like corn snakes seem like they can handle just about anything. Um, I've used NYX in their enclosures. Um, when I had wood mites, just trying to kind of keep those under control because they're, they're not really problematic. Like they don't, you know, bother the snakes, but they can spread things around and it's just not clean cat. <laughs> I love you. You're very obnoxious. Just- yeah. Mites are the absolute worst. Yes. Yes, they are. Especially actual snake mites, but. This is the first time I've had to deal with actual snake mites. The other yeah. Like wood mites that came in the bedding. I never saw them on the animals, just on the paper towels and stuff. They like try to eat the feeders. So. Yeah, I've definitely had wood mites buying from like big box stores and stuff like that. I've had aspen with wood mites and stuff. Common. Yep. 
Um, but we made it way past two hours. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. We did it. So um, if anyone wants to get in contact with you, I know you have some snakes available. Where can they reach you? Uh, windserpents.com. Um, I've got babies posted there right now. That's the only place I've got them listed. So if you're interested in something, that's the best way to find them. Uh, I've got big pictures. Uh, we we vamped the website. Uh, Kyle did a great job. Um, he made it exactly the way I wanted it. Oh my God, Kat, would you stop? <laughs> um, it has links to my social media. So like my Facebook, um, I don't really do much with Facebook these days, but I do post on Instagram sometimes. I've been really bad about posting on Instagram recently because I had like no photos left to post. Um, but your Instagram is awesome and your pictures are amazing. Thank you. Uh, you should actually say that to him, but <laughs> photographer, I just make the snakes sit still and pretty and, uh, which is impossible. So, it's, you know, it's half the job. So yeah. I would, I would say 80% of the job. Mm, maybe I don't know. the setup. Yeah. I don't know. I can't get these things to stay still. Yeah. It's, it's my biggest. woe. It's really, especially adults, they just like spread out. As soon as you lift the hide, they're just like, oh, I have space. I can move now. Like, okay. They just explode. Yeah. Very annoying. But, uh, but yeah, windserpents.com. Uh, you can email me at contact at windserpents.com. Um, yeah. If you have questions or whatever. Uh, front, yeah, I've heard of frontline spray also. Um, I think Nick's does just as well so i'm probably just gonna stick to that but i, I might try the hot shots strips so we'll see we'll, we'll see if i feel brave enough to try it i've never used it i just use preventamite usually and so uh, yeah i could uh, i could probably get that i might try that yeah. oh it's worked for me but um portcitypet.com I got animals available. I've got bedding, substrates, all different things available. So go check it out. Laura, thanks for coming on again. Yeah, thanks for having me. We did it. And this time we went over two hours. Yay. We made up for it. Yeah, the cat's letting me know for sure. <laughs> Later, so Oscar. Thanks for showing up. <laughs>